Section zero of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field, by Walter Scott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field, by Walter Scott. Section zero. Introductory material by the author. Alas, that Scottish maid should sing the combat where her lover fell, that Scottish bard should wake the string, the triumph of our foes to tell. Leiden. To the right honourable Henry, Lord Montague, etc., 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 this romance is inscribed by the author. Advertisement. It is hardly to be expected that an author whom the public have honoured with some degree of applause should not be again a trespasser on their kindness yet the author of marmion must be supposed to feel some anxiety concerning its success since he is sensible that he hazards by this second intrusion any reputation which his first poem may have procured him the present story turns upon the private adventures of a fictitious character but it is called a tale of flodden field because the hero's fate is connected with that memorable defeat and the causes which led to it the design of the author was if possible to apprise his readers at the outset of the date of his story and to prepare them for the manners of the age in which it is laid any historical narrative far more an attempt at epic composition exceeded his plan of a romantic tale yet he may be permitted to hope from the popularity of the lay of the last minstrel than an attempt to paint the manners of the feudal times upon a broader scale and in the course of a more interesting story will not be unacceptable to the public the poem opens about the commencement of august and concludes with the defeat of flodden ninth september fifteen thirteen ashes steel eighteen o eight end of section zero Section one of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field, by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction to Canto First to William Stuart Rose, Esquire, Ashestiel, Ettrick Forest. November's sky is chill and drear, November's leaf is red and sear. Late, gazing down the steepy lynn that hems our little garden in, low in its dark and narrow glen you scarce the rivulet might ken so thick the tangled greenwood grew so feeble trilled the streamlet through now murmuring hoarse and frequent seen through bush and briar no longer green an angry brook it sweeps the glade brawls over rock and wild cascade and foaming brown with double speed hurries its waters to the tweed no longer autumn's glowing red upon our forest hills is shed no more beneath the evening beam fair tweed reflects their purple gleam away hath passed the heather bell that bloomed so rich on needpath fell sallow his brow and russet bare are now the sister heights of year the sheep before the pinching heaven to sheltered dale and down are driven where yet some faded herbage pines and yet a watery sunbeam shines in meek despondency they eye the withered sward and wintry sky and far beneath their summer hill stray sadly by glenkinnon's rill the shepherd shifts his mantle's fold and wraps him closer from the cold his dogs no merry circles wheel but shivering follow at his heel a cowering glance they often cast as deeper moans the gathering blast my imps though hardy bold and wild as best befits the mountain child feel the sad influence of the hour and wail the daisy's vanished flower their summer gambols tell and mourn and anxious ask will spring return and birds and lambs again be gay and blossoms clothe the hawthorn spray yes prattlers yes the daisy's flower again shall paint your summer bower again the hawthorn shall supply the garlands you delight to tie the lambs upon the lee shall bound the wild birds carol to the round and while you frolic light as they too short shall seem the summer day to mute and to material things new life revolving summer brings the genial call dead nature hears and in her glory reappears 
but oh my country's wintry state what second spring shall renovate what powerful call shall bid arise the buried warlike and the wise the mind that thought for britain's weal the hand that grasped the victor's steel the vernal sun new life bestows even on the meanest flower that blows but vainly vainly may he shine where glory weeps o'er nelson's shrine and vainly pierce the solemn gloom that shrouds o pitt thy hallowed tomb deep graved in every british heart oh never let those names depart say to your sons lo here his grave who victor died on gadite wave to him as to the burning leaven short bright resistless course was given where'er his country's foes were found was heard the fated thunder's sound till burst the bolt on yonder shore rolled blazed destroyed and was no more nor mourn ye less his perished worth who bade the conqueror go forth and launched that thunderbolt of war on egypt hafnia trafalgar who born to guide such high emprise for britain's weal was early wise alas to whom the almighty gave for britain's sins an early grave his worth who in his mightiest hour a bauble held the pride of power spumed at the sordid lust of pelf and served his albion for herself who when the frantic crowd amain strained at subjection's bursting rein or their wild mood full conquest gained the pride he would not crush restrained showed their fierce zeal a worthier cause and brought the free man's arm to aid the free man's laws hadst thou but lived though stripped of power a watchman on the lonely tower thy thrilling trump had roused the land when fraud or danger were at hand by thee as by the beacon light our pilots had kept course aright as some proud column though alone thy strength had propped the tottering throne now is the stately column broke the beacon light is quenched in smoke the trumpet's silver sound is still the warder silent on the hill oh think how to his latest day when death just hovering claimed his prey with palinure's unaltered mood firm at his dangerous post he stood each call for needful rest repelled with dying hand the rudder held till in his fall with fateful sway the steerage of the realm gave way then while on britain's thousand plains one unpolluted church remains whose peaceful bells ne'er sent around the bloody tocsin's maddening sound but still upon the hallowed day convoke the swains to praise and pray while faith and civil peace are dear grace this cold marble with a tear he who preserved them pitt lies here nor yet suppress the generous sigh because his rival slumbers nigh nor be thy requiescat dumb lest it be said o'er fox's tomb for talents mourn untimely lost when best employed and wanted most mourn genius high and law profound and wit that loved to play not wound and all the reasoning powers divine to penetrate resolve combine and feelings keen and fancies glow they sleep with him who sleeps below and if thou mournst they could not save from error him who owns this grave be every harsher thought suppressed and sacred be the last long rest here where the end of earthly things lays heroes patriots bards and kings where stiff the hand and still the tongue of those who fought and spoke and sung here where the fretted isles prolong the distant notes of holy song as if some angel spoke again all peace on earth good will to men if ever from an english heart oh here let prejudice depart and partial feeling cast aside record that fox a briton died when europe crouched to france's yoke and austria bent and prussia broke and the firm russian's purpose brave was bartered by a timorous slave even then dishonour's peace he spurned the sullied olive branch returned stood for his country's glory fast and nailed her colours to the mast heaven to reward his firmness gave a portion in this honoured grave and ne'er held marble in its trust of two such wondrous men the dust with more than mortal powers endowed how high they soared above the crowd theirs was no common party race jostling by dark intrigue for place like fabled gods their mighty war shook realms and nations in its jar beneath each banner proud to stand looked up the noblest of the land 
till through the british world were known the names of pitt and fox alone spells of such force no wizard grave e'er framed in dark thessalian cave though his could drain the ocean dry and force the planets from the sky these spells are spent and spent with these the wine of life is on the lees genius and taste and talent gone forever tombed beneath the stone where taming thought to human pride the mighty chiefs sleep side by side drop upon fox's grave the tear twill trickle to his rival's beer or pits the mournful requiem sound and fox's shall the notes rebound the solemn echo seems to cry here let their discord with them die speak not for those a separate doom whom fate made brothers in the tomb but search the land of living men where wilt thou find their like again rest ardent spirits till the cries of dying nature bid you rise not even your britain's groans can pierce the leaden silence of your hearse then oh how impotent and vain this grateful tributary strain though not unmarked from northern clime ye heard the border minstrel's rhyme his gothic harp has o'er you rung the bard you deigned to praise your deathless names has sung stay yet illusion stay a while my wilded fancy still beguile from this high theme how can i part ere half unloaded is my heart for all the tears ere sorrow drew and all the raptures fancy knew and all the keener rush of blood that throbs through bard in bard-like mood were here a tribute mean and low though all their mingled streams could flow woe wonder and sensation high in one spring tide of ecstasy it will not be it may not last the vision of enchantments past like frost-work in the morning ray the fancied fabric melts away each gothic arch memorial stone and long dim lofty aisle are gone and lingering last deception dear the choir's high sounds die on my ear now slow return the lonely down the silent pastures bleak and brown the farm begirt with copsewood wild the gambols of each frolic child mixing their shrill cries with the tone of tweed's dark waters rushing on prompt on unequal tasks to run thus nature disciplines her son meter she says for me to stray and waste the solitary day in plucking from yon fen the reed and watch it floating down the tweed or idly list the shrilling lay with which the milkmaid cheers her way marking its cadence rise and fail as from the field beneath her pail she trips it down the uneven dale meter for me by yonder cairn the ancient shepherd's tale to learn though oft he stop in rustic fear lest his old legends tire the ear of one who in his simple mind may boast of book-learned taste refined but thou my friend canst fitly tell for few have read romance so well how still the legendary lay o'er poet's bosom holds its sway how on the ancient minstrel strain time lays his palsied hand in vain and how our hearts at doughty deeds by warriors wrought in steely weeds still throb for fear and pity's sake as when the champion of the lake enters morgana's fated house or in the chapel perilous despising spells and demons force holds converse with the unburied course or when dame Genor's grace to move alas that lawless was their love he sought proud tarquin in his den and freed full sixty knights or when a sinful man and unconfessed he took the sangreal's holy quest and slumbering saw the vision high he might not view with waking eye the mightiest chiefs of british song scorned not such legends to prolong they gleam through spencer's elfin dream and mix in milton's heavenly theme and dryden in immortal strain had raised the table round again but that a ribald king and court bade him toil on to make them sport demanded for their niggard pay fit for their souls a looser lay licentious satire song and play the world defrauded of the high design profaned the god-given strength and marred the lofty line warmed by such names well may we then though dwindled sons of little men essay to break a feeble lance in the fair fields of old romance or seek the moated castle's cell where long through talisman and spell while tyrants ruled and damsels wept thy genius chivalry hath slept 
there sound the harpings of the north till he awake and sally forth on venturous quest to prick again in all his arms with all his train shield lance and brand and plume and scarf fay giant dragon squire and dwarf and wizard with his wand of might and errant maid on palfrey white around the genius weave their spells pure love who scarce his passion tells mystery half veiled and half revealed and honour with his spotless shield attention with fixed eye and fear that loves the tale she shrinks to hear and gentle courtesy and faith unchanged by sufferings time or death and valour lion mettled lord leaning upon his own good sword well has thy fair achievement shown a worthy meed may thus be won he tends oaks beneath whose shade there theme the merry minstrels made of ascapart and beavis bold and that red king who while of old through boulderwood the chase he led by his loved huntsman's arrow bled he tens oaks have heard again renewed such legendary strain for thou hast sung how he of gaul that amadis so famed in hall for oriana foiled in fight the necromancer's felon might and well in modern verse hast wove Partenopex's mystic love. Hear then, attentive to my lay, a knightly tale of Albion's elder day. End of section one. Section two of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field, by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto first, the castle. One. Day set on Norham's castled steep, and Tweed's fair river broad and deep, and Cheviot's mountains lone, the battled towers, the dungeon keep, the loophole grates where captives weep, the flanking walls that round it sweep, in yellow lustre shone the warriors on the turrets high moving athwart the evening sky seemed forms of giant height their armour as it caught the rays flashed back again the western blaze in lines of dazzling light two st george's banner broad and gay now faded as the fading ray less bright and less was flung the evening gale had scarce the power to wave it on the dungeon tower so heavily it hung the scouts had parted on their search the castle gates were barred above the gloomy portal arch timing his footsteps to a march the warder kept his guard low humming as he paced along some ancient border gathering song three a distant trampling sound he hears he looks abroad and soon appears o'er horncliff hill a plump of spears beneath a pennon gay a horseman darting from the crowd like lightning from a summer cloud spurs on his mettled courser proud before the dark array beneath the sable palisade that closed the castle barricade his bugle horn he blew the warder hasted from the wall and warned the captain in the hall for well the blast he knew and joyfully that night did call to sewer squire and seneschal four now broach ye a pipe of malvoisie bring pasties of the dough and quickly make the entrance free and bid my heralds ready be and every minstrel sound his glee and all our trumpets blow and from the platform spare ye not to fire a noble salvo shot lord marmion waits below then to the castle's lower ward sped forty yeomen tall the iron studded gates unbarred raised the portcullis's ponderous guard the lofty palisade unsparred and let the drawbridge fall five along the bridge lord marmion rode proudly his red roan charger trod his helm hung at the saddle-bow well by his visage you might know he was a stalwart knight and keen and had in many a battle been the scar on his brown cheek revealed a token true of bosworth field his eyebrow dark and eye of fire showed spirit proud and prompt to ire yet lines of thought upon his cheek did deep design and counsel speak his forehead by his cask worn bare his thick moustache and curly hair coal-black and grizzled here and there but more through toil than age 
his square turned joints and strength of limb showed him no carpet knight so trim but in close fight a champion grim in camps a leader sage six well was he armed from head to heel in mail and plate of milan's steel but his strong helm of mighty cost was all with burnished gold embossed amid the plumage of the crest a falcon hovered on her nest with wings outspread and forward breast in such a falcon on his shield soared sable in an azure field the golden legend bore aright who checks at me to death is dight blue was the charger's broidered rein blue ribbons decked his arching mane the knightly housing's ample fold was velvet blue and trapped with gold seven behind him rode two gallant squires of noble name and knightly sires they burned the gilded spurs to claim for well could each a war-horse tame could draw the bow the sword could sway and lightly bear the ring away nor less with courteous precepts stored could dance in hall and carve at board and frame love ditties passing rare and sing them to a lady fair eight four men-at-arms came at their backs with halbert bill and battle-axe they bore lord marmion's lance so strong and led his sumpter mules along and ambling palfrey when at need him listed ease his battle steed the last and trustiest of the four on high his forky pennon bore like swallow's tail in shape and hue fluttered the streamer glossy blue where blazoned sable as before the towering falcon seemed to soar last twenty yeomen two and two in hosen black and jerkins blue with falcons broidered on each breast attended on their lord's behest each chosen for an archer good new hunting craft by lake or wood each one a six-foot bow could bend and far a cloth-yard shaft could send each held a boar spear tough and strong and at their belts their quivers rung their dusty palfreys and array showed they had marched a weary way nine tis meet that i should tell you now how fairly armed and ordered how the soldiers of the guard with musket pike and morion to welcome noble marmion stood in the castle yard minstrels and trumpeters were there the gunner held his linstock yare for welcome shot prepared entered the train and such a clang as then through all his turrets rang old norham never heard ten the guards their morris pikes advanced the trumpets flourished brave the cannon from the ramparts glanced and thundering welcome gave a blithe salute in martial sort the minstrels well might sound for as lord marmion crossed the court he scattered angels round welcome to norham marmion stout heart and open hand well dost thou brook thy gallant rowan thou flower of english land eleven two pursuivants whom tabarts deck with silver scutcheon round their neck stood on the steps of stone by which you reach the dungeon gate and there with herald pomp and state they hailed lord marmion they hailed him lord of fontenay of lutterwood and scrivel bay of tamworth tower and town and he their courtesy to requite gave them a chain of twelve marks weight all as he lighted down now largesse largesse lord marmion knight of the crest of gold a blazoned shield in battle won ne'er guarded heart so bold twelve they marshalled him to the castle hall where the guests stood all aside and loudly nourished the trumpet call and the heralds loudly cried room lordings room for lord marmion with the crest and helm of gold full well we know the trophies won in the lists at cottiswold there vainly rafe de wilton strove against marmion's force to stand to him he lost his lady love and to the king his land ourselves beheld the listed field a sight both sad and fair we saw lord marmion pierce his shield and saw his saddle bare we saw the victor win the crest he wears with worthy pride and on the gibbet tree reversed his foeman's scutcheon tied place nobles for the falcon knight room room ye gentles gay for him who conquered in the right marmion of fontenay thirteen then stepped to meet that noble lord sir hugh the heron bold baron of twissel and of ford and captain of the hold 
he led lord marmion to the dais raised o'er the pavement high and placed him in the upper place they feasted full and high the whiles a northern harper rude chanted a rhyme of deadly feud how the fierce thirwalls and ridley's all stout willimund's wick and hard-riding dick and hughie of hawdon and will o the wall have set on sir albany featherstone hoar and taken his life at the dead man's shore scantly lord marmion's ear could brook the harper's barbarous lay yet much he praised the pains he took and well those pains did pay for lady's suit and minstrel strain by night should ne'er be heard in vain fourteen now good lord marmion heron says of your fair courtesy i pray you bide some little space in this poor tower with me here may you keep your arms from rust may breathe your war-horse well seldom hath passed a week but just or feat of arms befell the scots can rein a mettled steed and love to couch a spear saint george a stirring life they lead that have such neighbours near then stay with us a little space our northern wars to learn i pray you for your lady's grace lord marmion's brow grew stern fifteen the captain marked his altered look and gave a squire the sign a mighty wassail bowl he took and crowned it high with wine now pledge me here lord marmion but first i pray thee fair where hast thou left that page of thine that used to serve thy cup of wine whose beauty was so rare when last in raby towers we met the boy i closely eyed and often marked his cheeks were wet with tears he fain would hide his was no rugged horse-boy's hand to burnish shield or sharpen brand or saddle battle steed but meter seemed for lady fair to fan her cheek or curl her hair or through embroidery rich and rare the slender silk to lead his skin was fair his ringlets gold his bosom when he sighed the russet doublet's rugged folds could scarce repel its pride say hast thou given that lovely youth to serve in lady's bower or was the gentle page in sooth a gentle paramour sixteen lord marmion ill could brook such jest he rolled his kindling eye with pain his rising wrath suppressed yet made a calm reply that boy thou thought'st so goodly fair he might not brook the northern air more of his fate if thou wouldst learn i left him sick in lindisfarne enough of him but heron say why dost thy lovely lady gay disdain to grace the hall to-day or has that dame so fair and sage gone on some pious pilgrimage he spoke in covert scorn for fame whispered light tales of heron's dame seventeen unmarked at least unwrecked the taunt careless the knight replied no bird whose feathers gaily flaunt delights in cage to bide norham is grim and grated close hemmed in by battlement and fosse and many a darksome tower and better loves my lady bright to sit in liberty and light in fair queen margaret's bower we hold our greyhound in our hand our falcon on our glove but where shall we find leash or band for dame that loves to rove let the wild falcon soar her swing she'll stoop when she has tired her wing eighteen nay if with royal james's bride the lovely lady heron bide behold me here a messenger your tender greetings prompt to bear for to the scottish court addressed i journey at our king's behest and pray you of your grace provide for me and mine a trusty guide i have not ridden in scotland since james backed the cause of that mock prince warbeck that flemish counterfeit who on the gibbet paid the cheat then did i march with surrey's power what time we raised old aden tower nineteen for such like need my lord i trow norham can find you guides enow for here be some have pricked as far on scottish ground as to dunbar have drunk the monks of st bothan's ale and driven the beeves of lauderdale harried the wives of greenlaw's goods and given them light to set their hoods twenty now in good sooth lord marmion cried were i in warlike wise to ride a better guard i would not lack than your stout forayers at my back but as in form of peace i go a friendly messenger to know why through all scotland near and far their king is mustering troops for war 
the sight of plundering border spears might justify suspicious fears and deadly feud or thirst of spoil break out in some unseemly broil a herald were my fitting guide or friar sworn in peace to bide or pardoner or travelling priest or strolling pilgrim at the least twenty one the captain mused a little space and passed his hand across his face fain would i find the guide you want but ill may spare a pursuivant the only men that safe can ride mine errands on the scottish side and though a bishop built this fort few holy brethren here resort even our good chaplain as i ween since our last siege we have not seen the mass he might not sing or say upon one stinted meal a day so safe he sat in durham isle and prayed for our success the while our norham vicar woe betide is all too well in case to ride the priest of shoreswood he could rein the wildest war-horse in your train but then no spearman in the hall will sooner swear or stab or brawl friar john of tilmouth were the man a blithesome brother at the can a welcome guest in hall and bower he knows each castle town and tower in which the wine and ale is good twixt newcastle and holy rood but that good man as ill befalls hath seldom left our castle walls since on the vigil of st bede in evil hour he crossed the tweed to teach dame alison her creed old butrig found him with his wife and john an enemy to strife sans frock and hood fled for his life the jealous churl hath deeply swore that if again he venture o'er he shall shrieve penitent no more little he loves such risks i know yet in your guard perchance we'll go twenty two young selby at the fair hall-board carved to his uncle and that lord and reverently took up the word kind uncle woe were we each one if harm should hap to brother john he is a man of mirthful speech can many a game and gamble teach full well at tables can he play and sweep at bowls the stake away none can a lustier carol bawl the needfulest among us all when time hangs heavy in the hall and snow comes thick at christmas tide and we can neither hunt nor ride a foray on the scottish side the vowed revenge of butrig rude may end in worse than loss of hood let friar john in safety still in chimney corner snore his fill roast hissing crabs or flagons swill last night to norham there came one will better guide lord marmion nephew quoth heron by my fay well hast thou spoke say forth thy say twenty three here is a holy palmer come from salem first and last from rome one that hath kissed the blessed tomb and visited each holy shrine in araby and palestine on hills of armony hath been where noah's ark may yet be seen by that red sea too hath he trod which parted at the prophet's rod in sinai's wilderness he saw the mount where israel heard the law mid thunder dint and flashing leaven and shadows mists and darkness given he shows st james's cockle shell a fair montserrat too can tell and of that grot where olives nod where darling of each heart and eye from all the youth of sicily saint rosalie retired to god twenty four to stout saint george of norwich merry saint thomas too of canterbury cuthbert of durham and saint bede for his sins pardon hath he prayed he knows the passes of the north and seeks far shrines beyond the forth little he eats and long will wake and drinks but of the stream or lake this were a guide o'er moor and dale but when our john hath quaffed his ale as little as the wind that blows and warms itself against his nose kens he or cares which way he goes twenty five gramercy quoth lord marmion full loath were i that friar john that venerable man for me were placed in fear or jeopardy if this same palmer will me lead from hence to holy rood like his good saint i'll pay his meed instead of cockle shell or bead with angels fair and good i love such holy ramblers still they know to charm a weary hill with song romance or lay some jovial tale or glee or jest some lying legend at the least they bring to cheer the way twenty six ah noble sir young selby said and finger on his lip he laid this man knows much perchance e'en more than he could learn by holy law 
still to himself he's muttering and shrinks as at some unseen thing last night we listened at his cell strange sounds we heard and sooth to tell he murmured on till morn howe'er no living mortal could be near sometimes i thought i heard it plain as other voices spoke again i cannot tell i like it not friar john hath told us it is wrote no conscience clear and void of wrong can rest awake and pray so long himself still sleeps before his beads have marked ten aves and two creeds twenty seven let pass quoth marmion by my fay this man shall guide me on my way although the great arch fiend and he had sworn themselves of company so please you gentle youth to call this palmer to the castle hall the summoned palmer came in place his sable cowl o'erhung his face in his black mantle was he clad with peter's keys in cloth of red on his broad shoulders wrought the scallop shell his cap did deck the crucifix around his neck was from loretto brought his sandals were with travel tore staff budget bottle scrip he wore the faded palm branch in his hand showed pilgrim from the holy land twenty eight when as the palmer came in hall nor lord nor knight was there more tall or had a statelier step withal or looked more high and keen for no saluting did he wait but strode across the hall of state and fronted marmion where he sat as he his peer had been but his gaunt frame was worn with toil his cheek was sunk alas the while and when he struggled at a smile his eye looked haggard wild poor wretch the mother that him bare if she had been in presence there in his wan face and sunburnt hair she had not known her child danger long travel want or woe soon change the form that best we know for deadly fear can time out go and blanch at once the hair hard toil can roughen form and face and want can quench the eye's bright grace nor does old age a wrinkle trace more deeply than despair happy whom none of these befall but this poor palmer knew them all twenty nine lord marmion then his boon did ask the palmer took on him the task so he would march with morning tide to scottish court to be his guide but i have solemn vows to pay and may not linger by the way to fair st andrew's bound within the ocean cave to pray where good saint rule his holy lay from midnight to the dawn of day sung to the billows sound thence to saint philan's blessed well whose spring can frenzied dreams dispel and the crazed brain restore saint mary grant that cave or spring could back to peace my bosom bring or bid it throb no more thirty and now the midnight draught of sleep where wine and spices richly steep in massive bowl of silver deep the page presents on knee lord marmion drank a fair good rest the captain pledged his noble guest the cup went through among the rest who drained it merrily alone the palmer passed it by though selby pressed him courteously this was a sign the feast was o'er it hushed the merry wassail roar the minstrel ceased to sound soon in the castle naught was heard but the slow footstep of the guard pacing his sober round thirty one with early dawn lord marmion rose and first the chapel doors unclose then after morning rites were done a hasty mass from friar john and knight and squire had broke their fast on rich substantial repast lord marmion's bugles blew to horse then came the stirrup cup in course between the baron and his host no point of courtesy was lost high thanks were by lord marmion paid solemn excuse the captain made till filing from the gate had passed that noble train their lord the last then loudly rung the trumpet call thundered the cannon from the wall and shook the scottish shore around the castle eddied slow volumes of smoke as white as snow and hid its turrets hoar till they rolled forth upon the air and met the river breezes there which gave again the prospect fair end of section two section three of marmion a tale of flodden field by walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Introduction to Canto Second To the Reverend John Marriott, A.M. Ashestiel, Ettrick Forest The scenes are desert now and bare Where flourished once a forest fair When these waste glens with copse were lined And peopled with the heart and hind Yon thorn, perchance whose prickly spears Have fenced him for three hundred years While fell around his green compeers yon lonely thorn would he could tell the changes of his parent dell since he so grey and stubborn now waved in each breeze a sapling bough would he could tell how deep the shade a thousand mingled branches made how broad the shadows of the oak how clung the rowan to the rock and through the foliage showed his head with narrow leaves and berries red what pines on every mountain sprung or every dell what birches hung in every breeze what aspens shook what alders shaded every brook here in my shade methinks he'd say the mighty stag at noontide lay the wolf i've seen a fiercer game the neighbouring dingle bears his name with lurching step around me prowl and stop against the moon to howl the mountain boar on battle set his tusks upon my stem would wet while doe and roe and red deer good have bounded by through gay green wood then oft from newark's riven tower sallied a scottish monarch's power a thousand vassals mustered round with horse and hawk and horn and hound and i might see the youth intent guard every pass with crossbow bent and through the brake the rangers stalk and falconers hold the ready hawk and foresters in greenwood trim lead in the leash the gaze hounds grim attentive as the brachet's bay from the dark covert drove the prey to slip them as he broke away the startled quarry bounds amain as fast the gallant greyhounds strain whistles the arrow from the bow answers the harquebus below while all the rocking hills reply to hoof-clang hound and hunter's cry and bugles ringing lightsomely of such proud huntings many tales yet linger in our lonely dales up pathless ettrick and on yarrow where erst the outlaw drew his arrow but not more blithe that sylvan court than we have been at humbler sport though small our pomp and mean our game our mirth dear marriott was the same rememberst thou my greyhounds true or holt or hill there never flew from slip or leash there never sprang more fleet of foot or sure of fang nor dull between each merry chase passed by the intermitted space for we had fair resource in store in classic and in gothic lore we marked each memorable scene and held poetic talk between nor hill nor brook we paced along but had its legend or its song all silent now for now are still thy bowers untenanted bow hill no longer from thy mountains dun the yeoman hears the well-known gun and while his honest heart glows warm at thought of his paternal farm round to his mates a brimmer fills and drinks the chieftain of the hills no fairy forms in yarrow's bowers trip o'er the walks or tend the flowers fair as the elves whom janet saw by moonlight dance on carterhaw no youthful barons left to grace the forest sheriff's lonely chase and ape in manly step and tone the majesty of oberon and she is gone whose lovely face is but her least and lowest grace though if to sylphid queen twere given to show our earth the charms of heaven she could not glide along the air with form more light or face more fair nor more the widow's deafened ear grows quick that lady's step to hear at noontide she expects her not nor busies her to trim the cot pensive she turns her humming wheel or pensive cooks her orphan's meal yet blesses ere she deals their bread the gentle hand by which they're fed from yare which hills so closely bind scarce can the tweed his passage find though much he fret and chafe and toil till all his eddying currents boil her long descended lord is gone and left us by the stream alone and much i miss those sportive boys companions of my mountain joys just at the age twixt boy and youth when thought is speech and speech is truth close to my side with what delight they pressed to hear of wallace white when pointing to his airy mound i called his ramparts holy ground kindled their brows to hear me speak and i have smiled to feel my cheek despite the difference of our years return again the glow of theirs ah happy boys such feelings pure they will not cannot long endure 
condemned to stem the world's rude tide you may not linger by the side for fate shall thrust you from the shore and passion ply the sail and oar yet cherish the remembrance still of the lone mountain and the rill for trust dear boys the time will come when fiercer transport shall be dumb and you will think right frequently but well i hope without a sigh on the free hours that we have spent together on the brown hills bent when musing on companions gone we doubly feel ourselves alone something my friend we yet may gain there is a pleasure in this pain it soothes the love of lonely rest deep in each gentler heart impressed tis silent amid worldly toils and stifled soon by mental broils but in a bosom thus prepared its still small voice is often heard whispering a mingled sentiment twixt resignation and content oft in my mind such thoughts awake by lone st mary's silent lake thou knowest it well nor fen nor sedge pollute the pure lake's crystal edge abrupt and sheer the mountains sink at once upon the level brink and just a trace of silver sand marks where the water meets the land far in the mirror bright and blue each hill's huge outline you may view shaggy with heath but lonely bare nor tree nor bush nor brake is there save where of land yon slender line bears thwart the lake the scattered pine yet even this nakedness has power and aids the feeling of the hour nor thicket dell nor copse you spy where living thing concealed might lie nor point retiring hides a dell where swain or woodman lone might dwell there's nothing left to fancy's guess you see that all is loneliness and silence aids though the steep hills send to the lake a thousand rills in summer tide so soft they weep the sound but lulls the ear asleep your horse's hoof-tread sounds too rude so still is the solitude nought living meets the eye or ear but well i ween the dead are near for though in feudal strife a foe hath laid our lady's chapel low yet still beneath the hallowed soil the peasant rests him from his toil and dying bids his bones be laid where erst his simple fathers prayed if age had tamed the passion's strife and fate had cut my ties to life here have i thought twas sweet to dwell and rear again the chaplain's cell like that same peaceful hermitage where milton longed to spend his age twas sweet to mark the setting day on boar hope's lonely top decay and as it faint and feeble died on the broad lake and mountain's side to say thus pleasures fade away youth talents beauty thus decay and leave us dark forlorn and grey then gaze on dry hope's ruined tower and think on yarrow's faded flower and when that mountain sound i heard which bids us be for storm prepared the distant rustling of his wings as up his force the tempest brings to a sweet ere yet his terrors rave to sit upon the wizard's grave that wizard priests whose bones are thrust from company of holy dust on which no sunbeam ever shines so superstition's creed divines thence view the lake with sullen roar heave her broad billows to the shore and mark the wild swans mount the gale spread wide through mist their snowy sail and ever stoop again to lave their bosoms on the surging wave then when against the driving hail no longer might my plaid avail back to my lonely home retire and light my lamp and trim my fire there ponder o'er some mystic lay till the wild tale had all its sway and in the bittern's distant shriek i heard unearthly voices speak and thought the wizard priest was come to claim again his ancient home and bade my busy fancy range to frame him fitting shape and strange till from the task my brow i cleared and smiled to think that i had feared but chief twas sweet to think such life though but escape from fortune's strife something most matchless good and wise a great and grateful sacrifice and deem each hour to musing given a step upon the road to heaven yet him whose heart is ill at ease such peaceful solitudes displease he loves to drown his bosom's jar amid the elemental war and my black palmer's choice had been some ruder and more savage scene like that which frowns round dark lock skeen 
there eagles scream from isle to shore down all the rocks the torrents roar o'er the black waves incessant driven dark mists infect the summer heaven through the rude barriers of the lake away its hurrying waters break faster and whiter dash and curl till down yon dark abyss they hurl rises the fog smoke white as snow thunders the viewless stream below diving as if condemned to lave some demon's subterranean cave who prisoned by enchanter's spell shakes the dark rock with groan and yell and well that palmer's form and mien had suited with the stormy scene just on the edge straining his ken to view the bottom of the den where deep deep down and far within toils with the rocks the roaring lin then issuing forth one foamy wave and wheeling round the giant's grave white as the snowy charger's tail drives down the pass of moffat dale marriott thy harp on isis strung to many a border theme has rung then list to me and thou shalt know of this mysterious man of woe end of section three Section four of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto second, the convent. One. The breeze which swept away the smoke round Norham Castle rolled, when all the loud artillery spoke with lightning flash and thunderstroke as Marmion left the hold it curled not tweed alone that breeze for far upon northumbrian seas it freshly blew and strong where from high whitby's cloistered pile bound to st cuthbert's holy isle it bore a bark along upon the gale she stooped her side and bounded o'er the swelling tide as she were dancing home the merry seamen laughed to see their gallant ship so lustily furrow the green sea foam much joyed they in their honoured freight for on the deck in chair of state the abbess of saint hilda placed with five fair nuns the galley graced two twas sweet to see these holy maids like birds escaped to greenwood shades their first flight from the cage how timid and how curious too for all to them was strange and new and all the common sights they view their wonderment engage one eyed the shrouds and swelling sail with many a benedicite one at the rippling surge grew pale and would for terror pray then shrieked because the sea-dog nigh his round black head and sparkling eye reared o'er the foaming spray and one would still adjust her veil disordered by the summer gale perchance lest some more worldly eye her dedicated charms might spy perchance because such action graced her fair turned arm and slender waist light was each simple bosom there save two who ill might pleasure share the abbess and the novice clare three the abbess was of noble blood but early took the veil and hood ere upon life she cast a look or knew the world that she forsook fair too she was and kind had been as she was fair but ne'er had seen for her a timid lover's sigh nor knew the influence of her eye love to her ear was but a name combined with vanity and shame her hopes her fears her joys were all bounded within the cloister wall the deadliest sin her mind could reach was of monastic rule the breach and her ambition's highest aim to emulate st hilda's fame for this she gave her ample dower to raise the convent's eastern tower for this with carving rare and quaint she decked the chapel of the saint and gave the relic shrine of cost with ivory and gems embossed the poor her convent's bounty blessed the pilgrim in its halls found rest four black was her garb her rigid rule reformed on benedictine school her cheek was pale her form was spare vigils and penitence austere had early quenched the light of youth but gentle was the dame in sooth though vain of her religious sway she loved to see her maids obey yet nothing stern was she in cell and the nuns loved their abbess well sad was this voyage to the dame summoned to lindisfarne she came there with st cuthbert's abbot old and tynemouth's prioress to hold a chapter of st benedict for inquisition stern and strict on two apostates from the faith and if need were to doom to death five 
Nought say I here of Sister Clare, save this, that she was young and fair. As yet a novice unprofessed, lovely and gentle, but distressed. She was betrothed to one now dead, or worse, who had dishonoured fled. Her kinsman bade her give her hand to one who loved her for her land. Herself, almost broken-hearted now, was bent to take the vestal vow, and shroud, within St. Hilda's gloom, her blasted hopes and withered bloom. 6. She sat upon the galley's prow, and seemed to mark the waves below. Nay, seemed so fixed her look and eye, to count them as they glided by. She saw them not. T'was seeming all. Far other scene her thoughts recall. A sun-scorched desert, waste and bare, nor waves nor breezes murmured there. There saw she, where some careless hand o'er a dead corpse had heaped the sand, to hide it till the jackals come, to tear it from the scanty tomb. See what a woeful look was given as she raised up her eyes to heaven. 7. Lovely and gentle and distressed, these charms might tame the fiercest breast. Harpers have sung and poets told that he in fury uncontrolled the shaggy monarch of the wood before a virgin fair and good hath pacified his savage mood. But passions in the human frame oft put the lion's rage to shame and jealousy by dark intrigue with sordid avarice in league had practised with their bowl and knife against the mourner's harmless life this crime was charged against those who lay prisoned in cuthbert's islet grey eight and now the vessel skirts the strand of mountainous northumberland towns towers and halls successive rise and catch the nuns delighted eyes Monk Wearmouth soon behind them lay, and Tynemouth's priory and bay. They marked amid her trees the hall of lofty Satan Delaval. They saw the blithe and Wandsbeck floods rush to the sea through sounding woods. They passed the tower of Widrington, mother of many a valiant son. At Coquette Isle their beads they tell to the good saint who owned the cell. Then did the Aln attention claim, and Walkworth, proud of Percy's name and next they crossed themselves to hear the whitening breakers sound so near there boiling through the rocks they roar on dunstanborough's caverned shore thy tower proud bamborough marked they there king ida's castle huge and square from its tall rock look grimly down and on the swelling ocean frown then from the coast they bore away and reached the holy island's bay nine the tide did now its flood mark gain and girdled in the saint's domain for with the flow and ebb its style varies from continent to isle dry shod o'er sands twice every day the pilgrims to the shrine find way twice every day the waves efface of staves and sandaled feet the trace as to the port the galley flew higher and higher rose to view the castle with its battled walls the ancient monastery's halls a solemn huge and dark red pile placed on the margin of the isle ten in saxon strength that abbey frowned with massive arches broad and round that rose alternate row and row on ponderous columns short and low built ere the art was known by pointed aisle and shafted stalk the arcades of an alleyed walk to emulate in stone on the deep walls the heathen dane had poured his impious rage in vain and needful was such strength to these exposed to the tempestuous seas scourged by the wind's eternal sway open to rovers fierce as they which could twelve hundred years withstand winds waves and northern pirates hand not but that portions of the pile rebuilded in a later style showed where the spoiler's hand had been not but the wasting sea-breeze keen had worn the pillar's carving quaint and moulded in his niche the saint and rounded with consuming power the pointed angles of each tower yet still entire the abbey stood like veteran worn but unsubdued eleven soon as they neared his turrets strong the maidens raised st hilda's song and with the sea-wave and the wind their voices sweetly shrill combined and made harmonious close then answering from the sandy shore half drowned amid the breakers roar according chorus rose down to the haven of the isle the monks and nuns in order file from cuthbert's cloisters grim banner and cross and relics there to meet st hilda's maids they bear 
and as they caught the sounds on air they echoed back the hymn the islanders in joyous mood rushed emulously through the flood to hail the bark to land conspicuous by her veil and hood signing the cross the abbess stood and blessed them with her hand twelve suppose we now the welcome said suppose the convent banquet made all through the holy dome through cloister aisle and gallery wherever vestal maid might pry no risk to meet unhallowed eye the stranger sisters roam till fell the evening damp with dew and the sharp sea breeze coldly blew for there even summer night is chill then having strayed and gazed their fill they closed around the fire and all in turn essayed to paint the rival merits of their saint a theme that ne'er can tire a holy maid for be it known that their saint's honour is their own thirteen then whitby's nuns exulting told how to their house three barons bold must menial service do while horns blow out a note of shame and monks cry fie upon your name in wrath for loss of sylvan game saint hilda's priest ye slew this on ascension day each year while labouring on our harbour pier must herbert bruce and percy hear they told how in their convent cell a saxon princess once did dwell the lovely edelfled and how of thousand snakes each one was changed into a coil of stone when holy hilda prayed themselves within their holy bound their stony folds had often found they told how sea-fowls pinions fail as over whitby's towers they sail and sinking down with flutterings faint they do their homage to the saint fourteen nor did saint cuthbert's daughters fail to vie with these in holy tale his body's resting-place of old how oft their patron changed they told how when the rude dane burned their pile the monks fled forth from holy isle or northern mountain marsh and moor from sea to sea from shore to shore seven years saint cuthbert's corpse they bore they rested them in fair melrose but though alive he loved it well not there his relics might repose for wondrous tale to tell in his stone coffin forth he rides a ponderous bark for river tides yet light as gossamer it glides downward to tilmouth cell nor long was his abiding there far southward did the saint repair chesterler street and ripon saw his holy corpse ere warder law hailed him with joy and fear and after many wanderings past he chose his lordly seat at last where his cathedral huge and vast looks down upon the weir there deep in durham's gothic shade his relics are in secret laid but none may know the place save of his holiest servants three deep sworn to solemn secrecy who share that wondrous grace fifteen who may his miracles declare even scotland's dauntless king and heir although with them they led galwegians wild as ocean's gale and lodon's knights all sheathed in mail and the bold men of teviotdale before his standard fled twas he to vindicate his reign edged alfred's falchion on the dane and turned the conqueror back again when with his norman bowyer band he came to waste northumberland sixteen but fain st hilda's nuns would learn if on a rock by lindisfarne st cuthbert sits and toils to frame the sea-born beads that bear his name such tales had whitby's fishers told and said they might his shape behold and hear his anvil sound a deadened clang a huge dim form seen but and heard when gathering storm and night were closing round but this as tale of idle fame the nuns of lindisfarne disclaim Seventeen while round the fire such legends go far different was the scene of woe where in a secret isle beneath council was held of life and death it was more dark and lone that vault than the worst dungeon cell old colwulf built it for his fault in penitence to dwell when he for cowl and beads laid down the saxon battle-axe and crown this den which chilling every sense of feeling hearing sight was called the vault of penitence excluding air and light was by the prelate sexhelm made a place of burial for such dead as having died in mortal sin might not be laid the church within twas now a place of punishment 
whence if so loud a shriek was sent as reached the upper air the hearers blessed themselves and said the spirits of the sinful dead bemoaned their torments there eighteen but though in the monastic pile did of this penitential isle some vague tradition go few only save the abbot knew where the place lay and still more few were those who had from him the clue to that dread vault to go victim and executioner were blindfold when transported there in low dark rounds the arches hung from the rude rock the side walls sprung the gravestones rudely sculptured o'er half sunk in earth by time half war were all the pavement of the floor the mildew drops fell one by one with tinkling plash upon the stone a cresset in an iron chain which served to light this drear domain with damp and darkness seemed to strive as if it scarce might keep alive and yet it dimly served to show the awful conclave met below nineteen there met to doom in secrecy were placed the heads of convents three all servants of st benedict the statutes of whose order strict on iron table lay in long black dress on seats of stone behind were these three judges shown by the pale cresset's ray the abbess of st hilda's there sat for a space with visage bare until to hide her bosom's swell and tear-drops that for pity fell she closely drew her veil yon shrouded figure as i guess by her proud mien and flowing dress is tynemouth's haughty prioress and she with awe looks pale and he that ancient man whose sight has long been quenched by age's night upon whose wrinkled brow alone nor ruth nor mercy's trace is shown whose look is hard and stern saint cuthbert's abbot is his style for sanctity called through the isle the saint of lindisfarne twenty before them stood a guilty pair but though an equal fate they share yet one alone deserves our care her sex a page's dress belied the cloak and doublet loosely tied obscured her charms but could not hide her cap down o'er her face she drew and on her doublet breast she tried to hide the badge of blue lord marmion's falcon crest but at the prioress's command a monk undid the silken bands that tied her tresses fair and raised the bonnet from her head and down her slender form they spread in ringlets rich and rare constance de beverley they know sister professed of fontrevaux whom the church numbered with the dead for broken vows and convent fled twenty one when thus her face was given to view although so pallid was her hue it did a ghastly contrast bear to those bright ringlets glistering fair her look composed and steady eye bespoke a matchless constancy and there she stood so calm and pale that but her breathing did not fail and motion slight of eye and head and of her bosom warranted that neither sense nor pulse she lacks you might have thought a form of wax wrought to the very life was there so still she was so pale so fair twenty two her comrade was a sordid soul such as does murder for a meed who but of fear knows no control because his conscience seared and foul feels not the import of his deed one whose brute feeling ne'er aspires beyond his own more brute desires such tools the tempter ever needs to do the savagest of deeds for them no visioned terrors daunt their nights no fancied spectres haunt one fear with them of all most base the fear of death alone finds place this wretch was clad in frock and cowl and shamed not loud to moan and howl his body on the floor to dash and crouch like hound beneath the lash while his mute partner standing near waited her doom without a tear twenty three yet well the luckless wretch might shriek well might her paleness terror speak for there were seen in that dark wall two niches narrow deep and tall who enters at such grisly door shall ne'er i ween find exit more in each a slender meal was laid of roots of water and of bread by each in benedictine dress two haggard monks stood motionless who holding high a blazing torch showed the grim entrance of the porch reflecting back the smoky beam the dark red walls and arches gleam hewn stones and cement were displayed and building tools in order laid twenty four 
these executioners were chose as men who were with mankind foes and with despite and envy fired into the cloister had retired or who in desperate doubt of grace strove by deep penance to efface of some foul crime the stain for as the vassals of her will such men the church selected still as either joyed in doing ill or thought more grace to gain if in her cause they wrestled down feelings their nature strove to own by strange device were they brought there they knew not how and knew not where twenty five and now that blind old abbot rose to speak the chapter's doom on those the wall was to enclose alive within the tomb but stopped because that woeful maid gathering her powers to speak essayed twice she essayed and twice in vain her accents might no utterance gain nought but imperfect murmurs slipped from her convulsed and quivering lip twixt each attempt all was so still you seemed to hear a distant rill to ocean's swells and falls for though this fault of sin and fear was to the sounding surge so near a tempest there you scarce could hear so massive were the walls twenty six at length an effort sent apart the blood that curdled to her heart and light came to her eye and colour dawned upon her cheek a hectic and a fluttered streak like that left on the cheviot peak by autumn's stormy sky and when her silence broke at length still as she spoke she gathered strength and armed herself to bear it was a fearful sight to see such high resolve and constancy in form so soft and fair twenty seven i speak not to implore your grace well know i for one minute's space successless might i sue nor do i speak your prayers to gain for if a death of lingering pain to cleanse my sins be penance vain vain are your masses too i listened to a traitor's tale i left the convent and the veil for three long years i bowed my pride a horse-boy in his train to ride and well my folly's meed he gave who forfeited to be his slave all here and all beyond the grave he saw young clara's face more fair he knew her of broad lands the air forgot his vows his faith forswore and constance was beloved no more tis an old tale and often told but did my fate and wish agree ne'er had been read in story old of maiden true betrayed for gold that loved or was avenged like me twenty eight the king approved his favourite's aim in vain a rival barred his claim whose fate with clare's was plight for he attains that rival's fame with treason's charge and on they came in mortal lists to fight their oaths are said their prayers are prayed their lances in the rest are laid they meet in mortal shock and hark the throng with thundering cry shout marmion marmion to the sky de wilton to the block say ye who preach heaven shall decide when in the lists two champions ride say was heaven's justice here when loyal in his love and faith wilton found overthrow or death beneath a traitor's spear how false the charge how true he fell this guilty packet best can tell then drew a packet from her breast paused gathered voice and spoke the rest twenty nine still was false marmion's bridal stayed to whitby's convent fled the maid the hated match to shun ho oh, shifts she thus king henry cried sir marmion she shall be thy bride if she were sworn a nun one way remained the king's command sent marmion to the scottish land i lingered here and rescue planned for clara and for me this caitiff monk for gold did swear he would to whitby's shrine repair and by his drugs my rival fair a saint in heaven should be but ill the dastard kept his oath whose cowardice has undone us both thirty and now my tongue the secret tells not that remorse my bosom swells but to assure my soul that none shall ever wed with marmion had fortune my last hope betrayed this packet to the king conveyed had given him to the headsman's stroke although my heart that instant broke now men of death work forth your will for i can suffer and be still and come he slow or come he fast it is but death who comes at last thirty one yet dread me from my living tomb ye vassal slaves of bloody rome 
if marmion's late remorse should wake full soon such vengeance will he take that you shall wish the fiery dane had rather been your guest again behind a darker hour ascends the altars quake the crozier bends the ire of a despotic king rides forth upon destruction's wing then shall these vaults so strong and deep burst open to the sea winds sweep some traveller then shall find my bones whitening amid disjointed stones and ignorant of priests cruelty marvel such relics here should be thirty two fixed was her look and stern her air back from her shoulders streamed her hair the locks that wont her brow to shade stared up erectly from her head her figure seemed to rise more high her voice despair's wild energy had given a tone of prophecy appalled the astonished conclave sat with stupid eyes the men of fate gazed on the light inspired form and listened for the avenging storm the judges felt the victim's dread no hand was moved no word was said till thus the abbot's doom was given raising his sightless balls to heaven sister let thy sorrows cease sinful brother part in peace from that dire dungeon place of doom of execution too and tomb paced forth the judges three sorrow it were and shame to tell the butcher work that there befell when they had glided from the cell of sin and misery thirty three an hundred winding steps convey that conclave to the upper day but ere they breathed the fresher air they heard the shriekings of despair and many a stifled groan with speed their upward way they take such speed as age and fear can make and crossed themselves for terror's sake as hurrying tottering on even in the vespers heavenly tone they seemed to hear a dying groan and bade the passing knell to toll for welfare of a parting soul slow o'er the midnight wave it swung northumbrian rocks in answer rung to walkworth's cell the echoes rolled his beads the wakeful hermit told the bamborough peasant raised his head but slept ere half a prayer he said so far was heard the mighty knell the stag sprung up on cheviot fell spread his broad nostril to the wind listed before aside behind then couched him down beside the hind and quaked among the mountain fern to hear that sound so dull and stern End of section four. Section five of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction to Canto third to William Erskine, Esquire, Ashesteel, Ettrick Forest. Like April morning clouds that pass with varying shadow o'er the grass, and imitate on field and furrow life's chequered scene of joy and sorrow like streamlet of the mountain north now in a torrent racing forth now winding slow its silver train and almost slumbering on the plain like breezes of the autumn day whose voice inconstant dies away and ever swells again as fast when the ear deems its murmur past thus various my romantic theme flits winds or sinks a morning dream yet pleased our eye pursues the trace of light and shades in constant race pleased views the rivulet afar weaving its maze irregular and pleased we listen as the breeze heaves its wild sigh through autumn trees then wild as cloud or stream or gale flow on flow unconfined my tale need i to thee dear erskine tell i love the license all too well in sounds now lowly and now strong to raise the desultory song oft when mid such capricious chime some transient fit of lofty rhyme to thy kind judgment seemed excuse for many an error of the muse oft hast thou said if still misspent thine hours to poetry are lent go and to tame thy wandering course quaff from the fountain at the source approach those masters o'er whose tomb immortal laurels ever bloom instructive of the feebler bard still from the grave their voice is heard from them and from the paths they showed choose honoured guide and practised road nor ramble on through brake and maze with harpers rude of barbarous days or deemst thou not our later time yields topic meet for classic rhyme hast thou no elegiac verse for brunswick's venerable hearse what 
not a line a tear a sigh when valor bleeds for liberty o hero of that glorious time when with unrivalled light sublime though martial austria and though all the might of russia and the gaul though banded europe stood her foes the star of brandenburg arose thou couldst not live to see her beam forever quenched in jena's stream lamented chief it was not given to thee to change the doom of heaven and crush that dragon in its birth predestined scourge of guilty earth lamented chief not thine the power to save in that presumptuous hour when prussia hurried to the field and snatched the spear but left the shield valour and skill twas thine to try and tried in vain twas thine to die ill had it seemed thy silver hair the last the bitterest pang to share for princedoms reft and scutcheons riven and birthrights to usurpers given thy lands thy children's wrongs to feel and witness woes thou couldst not heal on thee relenting heaven bestows for honoured life an honoured close and when revolves in time's sure change the hour of germany's revenge when breathing fury for her sake some new arminius shall awake her champion ere he strike shall come to whet his sword on brunswick's tomb or of the red cross hero teach dauntless in dungeon as on breach alike to him the sea the shore the brand the bridle or the oar alike to him the war that calls its votaries to the shattered walls which the grim turk besmeared with blood against the invincible made good or that whose thundering voice could wake the silence of the polar lake when stubborn russ and metalled swede on the warped wave their death game played or that where vengeance and affright howled round the father of the fight who snatched on alexandria's sand the conqueror's wreath with dying hand or if to touch such chord be thine restore the ancient tragic line and emulate the notes that rung from the wild harp which silent hung by silver avon's holy shore till twice an hundred years rolled o'er when she the bold enchantress came with fearless hand and heart on flame from the pale willow snatched the treasure and swept it with a kindred measure till avon's swans while rung the grove with montfort's hate and basil's love awakening at the inspired strain deemed their own shakespeare lived again thy friendship thus thy judgment wronging with praises not to me belonging in task more meet for mightiest powers wouldst thou engage my thriftless hours but say my erskine hast thou weighed that secret power by all obeyed which warps not less the passive mind its source concealed or undefined whether an impulse that has birth soon as the infant wakes on earth one with our feelings and our powers and rather part of us than ours or whether fitlier termed the sway of habit formed in early day howe'er derived its force confessed rules with despotic sway the breast and drags us on by viewless chain while taste and reason plead in vain look east and ask the belgian why beneath batavia's sultry sky he seeks not eager to inhale the freshness of the mountain gale content to rear his whitened wall beside the dank and dull canal he'll say from youth he loved to see the white sail gliding by the tree or see yon weather-beaten hind whose sluggish herds before him wind whose tattered plaid and rugged cheek his northern clime and kindred speak through england's laughing meads he goes and england's wealth around him flows ask if it would content him well at ease in those gay plains to dwell where hedgerows spread a verdant screen and spires and forests intervene and the neat cottage peeps between no not for these will he exchange his dark lochaber's boundless range nor for fair devon's meads forsake benevis gray and carries lake thus while i ape the measure wild of tales that charmed me yet a child rude though they be still with the chime return the thoughts of early time and feelings roused in life's first day glow in the line and prompt the lay then rise those crags that mountain tower which charmed my fancy's wakening hour though no broad river swept along to claim perchance heroic song though sighed no groves in summer gale to prompt of love a softer tale though scarce a puny streamlet's speed claimed homage from a shepherd's reed yet was poetic impulse given by the green hill and clear blue heaven it was a barren scene and wild where naked cliffs were rudely piled but ever and anon between lay velvet tufts of loveliest green 
and well the lonely infant knew recesses where the wallflower grew and honeysuckle loved to crawl up the low crag and ruined wall i deemed such nooks the sweetest shade the sun in all its round surveyed and still i thought that shattered tower the mightiest work of human power and marvelled as the aged hind with some strange tale bewitched my mind of forayers who with headlong force down from that strength had spurred their horse their southern rapine to renew far in the distant cheviot's blue and home returning filled the hall with revel wassel rout and brawl methought that still with trump and clang the gateway's broken arches rang methought grim features seamed with scars glared through the window's rusty bars and ever by the winter hearth old tales i heard of woe or mirth of lovers slights of ladies charms of witches spells of warriors arms of patriot battles won of old by wallace white and bruce the bold of later fields of feud and fight when pouring from their highland height the scottish clans in headlong sway had swept the scarlet ranks away while stretched at length upon the floor again i fought each combat o'er pebbles and shells in order laid the mimic ranks of war displayed and onward still the scottish lion bore and still the scattered southron fled before still with vain fondness could i trace anew each kind familiar face that brightened at our evening fire from the thatched mansion's grey-haired sire wise without learning plain and good and sprung of scotland's gentler blood whose eye in age quick clear and keen showed what in youth its glance had been whose doom discording neighbours sought content with equity unbought to him the venerable priest our frequent and familiar guest whose life and manners well could paint alike the student and the saint alas whose speech too oft i broke with gambol rude and timeless joke for i was wayward bold and wild a self-willed imp a grandame's child but half a plague and half a jest was still endured beloved caressed from me thus nurtured dost thou ask the classic poet's well conned task nay erskine nay on the wild hill let the wild heath bell flourish still cherish the tulip prune the vine but freely let the woodbine twine and leave untrimmed the eglantine nay my friend nay since oft thy praise hath given fresh vigour to my lays since oft thy judgment could refine my flattened thought or cumbrous line still kind as is thy wont attend and in the minstrel spare the friend though wild as cloud as stream as gale flow forth flow unrestrained my tale end of section five section six of marmion a tale of flodden field by walter scott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto Third, The Hostel or Inn. One. The livelong day, Lord Marmion rode. The mountain path, the palmer showed by glen and streamlet, winded still, where stunted birches hid the rill. They might not choose the lowland road, for the merse forayers were abroad, who fired with hate and thirst of prey, had scarcely failed to bar their way oft on the trampling band from crown of some tall cliff the deer looked down on wing of jet from his repose in the deep heath the black cock rose sprung from the gorse the timid roe nor waited for the bending bow and when the stony path began by which the naked peak they won up flew the snowy ptarmigan the noon had long been passed before they gained the height of lammermoor thence winding down the northern way before them at the close of day old gifford's towers and hamlet lay two no summons calls them to the tower to spend the hospitable hour to scotland's camp the lord was gone his cautious dame in bower alone dreaded her castle to unclose so late to unknown friends or foes on through the hamlet as they paced before a porch whose front was graced with bush and flagon trimly placed lord marmion drew his rein the village inn seemed large though rude its cheerful fire and hearty food might well relieve his train down from their seats the horsemen sprung with jingling spurs the courtyard rung they bind their horses to the stall for forage food and firing call and various clamour fills the hall weighing the labour with the cost toils everywhere the bustling host 
three soon by the chimney's merry blaze through the rude hostel might you gaze might see where in dark nook aloof the rafters of the sooty roof bore wealth of winter cheer of sea-fowl dried and solon's store and gammons of the tusky boar and savoury haunch of deer the chimney arch projected wide above around it and beside were tools for housewives hand nor wanted in that martial day the implements of scottish fray the buckler lance and brand beneath its shade the place of state on oaken settle marmion sat and viewed around the blazing hearth his followers mix in noisy mirth whom with brown ale in jolly tide from ancient vessels ranged aside full actively their host supplied four theirs was the glee of martial breast and laughter theirs at little jest and oft lord marmion deigned to aid and mingle in the mirth they made for though with men of high degree the proudest of the proud was he yet trained in camps he knew the art to win the soldier's hardy heart they love a captain to obey boisterous as march yet fresh as may with open hand and brow as free lover of wine and minstrelsy ever the first to scale a tower as venturous in a lady's bower such buxom chief shall lead his host from india's fires to zembla's frost five resting upon his pilgrim staff right opposite the palmer stood his thin dark visage seen but half half hidden by his hood still fixed on marmion was his look which he who ill such gaze could brook strove by a frown to quell but not for that though more than once full met their stern encountering glance the palmer's visage fell six by fits less frequent from the crowd was heard the burst of laughter loud for still as squire and archer stared on that dark face and matted beard their glee and game declined all gazed at length in silence drear unbroke save when in comrade's ear some yeoman wondering in his fear thus whispered forth his mind saint mary saw'st thou e'er such sight how pale his cheek his eye how bright when e'er the firebrand's fickle light glances beneath his cowl full on our lord he sets his eye for his best palfrey would not i endure that sullen scowl seven but marmion as to chase the awe which thus had quelled their hearts who saw the ever varying firelight show that figure stern and face of woe now called upon a squire fitz eustace know'st thou not some lay to speed the lingering night away we slumber by the fire eight so please you thus the youth rejoined our choicest minstrels left behind ill may we hope to please your ear accustomed constant strains to hear the harp full deftly can he strike and wake the lover's lute alike to dear saint valentine no thrush sings livelier from a springtide bush no nightingale her lovelorn tune more sweetly warbles to the moon woe to the cause whate'er it be detains from us his melody lavished on rocks and billows stern or duller monks of lindisfarne now must i venture as i may to sing his favourite roundelay nine a mellow voice fitz eustace had the air he chose was wild and sad such have i heard in scottish land rise from the busy harvest band when falls before the mountaineer on lowland plains the ripened ear now one shrill voice the notes prolong now a wild chorus swells the song oft have i listened and stood still as it came softened up the hill and deemed it the lament of men who languished for their native glen and thought how sad would be such sound on susquehanna's swampy ground kentucky's wood encumbered brake or wild ontario's boundless lake where heart-sick exiles in the strain recalled fair scotland's hills again ten song where shall the lover rest whom the fates sever from his true maiden's breast parted for ever where through groves deep and high sounds the far billow where early violets die under the willow eleu loro soft shall be his pillow there through the summer day cool streams are laving there while the tempests sway scarce are boughs waving there thy rest shalt thou take parted for ever never again to wake never oh never eleu loro never oh never 
11. Where shall the traitor rest, he the deceiver, who could win maiden's breast, ruin, and leave her? In the lost battle, borne down by the flying, where mingles war's rattle with groans of the dying. Eleu loro, there shall he be lying. Her wing shall the eagle flap o'er the false-hearted, his warm blood the wolf shall lap, ere life be parted. Shame and dishonour sit by his grave ever. Blessing shall hallow it, never, oh never. Eleo loro, never, oh never. 12. It ceased the melancholy sound, and silence sunk on all around. The air was sad, but sadder still it fell on Marmion's ear and plained as if disgrace and ill and shameful death were near he drew his mantle past his face between it and the band and rested with his head a space reclining on his hand his thoughts i scan not but i ween that could their import have been seen the meanest groom in all the hall that e'er tied courser to a stall would scarce have wished to be their prey for lutterwood and fontenay thirteen high minds of native pride and force most deeply feel thy pangs remorse fear for their scourge mean villains have thou art the torturer of the brave yet fatal strength they boast to steel their minds to bear the wounds they feel even while they writhe beneath the smart of civil conflict in the heart for soon lord marmion raised his head and smiling to fitz eustace said is it not strange that as ye sung seemed in mine ear a death peal rung such as in nunneries they toll for some departing sister's soul say what may this portend then first the palmer silence broke the livelong day he had not spoke the death of a dear friend fourteen marmion whose steady heart and eye ne'er changed in worst extremity marmion whose soul could scantly brook even from his king a haughty look whose accents of command controlled in camps the boldest of the bold thought look and utterance failed him now fallen was his glance and flushed his brow for either in the tone or something in the palmer's look so full upon his conscience struck that answer he found none Thus oft it haps that when within they shrink at sense of secret sin, a feather daunts the brave. A fool's wild speech confounds the wise, and proudest princes veil their eyes before their meanest slave. 15. Well might he falter, by his aid was Constance Beverley betrayed. Not that he augured of the doom which on the living closed the tomb but tired to hear the desperate maid threaten by turns beseech upbraid and wrath because in wild despair she practised on the life of clare its fugitive the church he gave though not a victim but a slave and deemed restraint in convent strange would hide her wrongs and her revenge himself proud henry's favourite peer held romish thunder's idle fear secure his pardon he might hold for some slight mulct of penance gold thus judging he gave secret way when the stern priests surprised their prey his train but deemed the favourite page was left behind to spare his age or other if they deemed none dared to mutter what he thought and heard woe to the vassal who durst pry into lord marmion's privacy sixteen his conscience slept he deemed her well and safe secured in yonder cell but wakened by her favourite lay and that strange palmer's boding say that fell so ominous and drear full on the object of his fear to aid remorse's venomed throes dark tales of convent vengeance rose and constance late betrayed and scorned all lovely on his soul returned lovely as when at a treacherous call she left her convent's peaceful wall crimsoned with shame with terror mute dreading alike escape pursuit till love victorious or alarms hid fears and blushes in his arms alas he thought how changed that mean how changed these timid looks have been since years of guilt and of disguise have steeled her brow and armed her eyes no more of virgin terror speaks the blood that mantles in her cheeks fierce and unfeminine are there frenzy for joy for grief despair and i the cause for whom were given her peace on earth her hopes in heaven 
Would, thought he, as the picture grows, I on its stalk had left the rose. Oh, why should man's success remove the very charms that wake his love? Her convent's peaceful solitude is now a prison harsh and rude, and pent within the narrow cell, how will her spirit chafe and swell? How brook the stern monastic laws, the penance how, and I the cause? Vigil and scourge, perchance even worse, and twice he rose to cry, to horse, and twice his sovereign's mandate came, like damp upon a kindling flame. And twice he thought, gave I not charge she should be safe, though not at large? They durst not, for their island, shred one golden ringlet from her head. 18. While thus in Marmion's bosom strove repentance and reviving love, like whirlwinds whose contending sway I've seen Loch Venachar obey, their host the palmer's speech had heard, and talkative took up the word. I, reverend pilgrim, you, who stray from Scotland's simple land away, to visit realms afar, full often learn the art to know of future weal or future woe, by word or sign or star. Yet might a knight his fortune hear, if knight-like he despises fear, not far from hence, if fathers old are right our hamlet legend told. These broken words the menials move, for marvels still the vulgar love and marmion giving license cold his tale the host thus gladly told nineteen the host's tale a clerk could tell what years have flown since alexander filled our throne third monarch of that warlike name and eke the time when here he came to seek sir hugo then our lord a braver never drew a sword a wiser never at the hour of midnight spoke the word of power the same whom ancient records call the founder of the goblin hall i would sir knight your longer stay gave you that cavern to survey of lofty roof and ample size beneath the castle deep it lies to hew the living rock profound the floor to pave the arch to round there never toiled a mortal arm it all was wrought by word and charm and i have heard my grandsire say that the wild clamour and affray of those dread artisans of hell who laboured under hugo's spell sounded as loud as ocean's war among the caverns of dunbar twenty the king lord gifford's castle sought deep labouring with uncertain thought even then he mustered all his host to meet upon the western coast for norse and danish galleys plied their oars within the frith of clyde there floated Haco's banner trim above Norwayan warriors grim, savage of heart and large of limb, threatening both continent and isle, Butte, Arran, Cunningham, and Kyle. Lord Gifford, deep beneath the ground, heard Alexander's bugle sound, and tarried not his garb to change, but in his wizard habit strange came forth, a quaint and fearful sight, his mantle lined with fox-skins white, his high and wrinkled forehead bore a pointed cap, such as of yore clerks say that Pharaoh's Margi wore. His shoes were marked with cross and spell, upon his breast a pentacle, his zone of virgin parchment thin, or as some tell of dead man's skin bore many a planetary sign combust and retrograde and trine and in his hand he held prepared a naked sword without a guard twenty one dire dealings with the fiendish race had marked strange lines upon his face vigil and fast had worn him grim his eyesight dazzled seemed and dim as one unused to upper day even his own menials with dismay beheld sir knight the grisly sire in his unwonted wild attire unwonted for traditions run he seldom thus beheld the sun i know he said his voice was hoarse and broken seemed its hollow force i know the cause although untold why the king seeks his vassal's hold vainly from me my liege would know his kingdom's future weal or woe but yet if strong his arm and heart his courage may do more than art. 22. Of middle air the demons proud, who ride upon the racking cloud, can read, in fixed or wandering star, the issue of events afar. But still their sullen aid withhold, save when by mightier force controlled. Such late I summoned to my hall, and though so potent was the call, that scarce the deepest nook of hell I deemed a refuge from the spell, yet obstinate in silence still the haughty demon mocks my skill 
but thou who little know'st thy might as born upon that blessed night when yawning graves and dying groan proclaimed hell's empire overthrown with untaught valour shalt compel response denied to magic spell gramercy quoth our monarch free place him but front to front with me and by this good and honoured brand the gift of coeur de lion's hand soothly i swear that tide what tide the demon shall a buffet bide his bearing bold the wizard viewed and thus well pleased his speech renewed there spoke the blood of malcolm mark forth pacing hence at midnight dark the rampart seek whose circling crown crests the ascent of yonder down a southern entrance shalt thou find there halt and there thy bugle wind and trust thine elfin foe to see in guise of thy worst enemy couch then thy lance and spur thy steed upon him and st george to speed if he go down thou soon shalt know whate'er these airy sprites can show if thy heart fail thee in the strife i am no warrant for thy life twenty three soon as the midnight bell did ring alone and armed forth rode the king to that old camp's deserted round sir knight you well might mark the mound left hand the town the pictish race the trench long since in blood did trace the moor around is brown and bare the space within is green and fair the spot our village children know for there the earliest wild flowers grow but woe betide the wandering white that treads its circle in the night the breadth across a bowshot clear gives ample space for full career opposed to the four points of heaven by four deep gaps are entrance given the southernmost our monarch passed halted and blew a gallant blast and on the north within the ring appeared the form of england's king who then a thousand leagues afar in palestine waged holy war yet arms like england's did he wield alike the leopards in the shield alike his syrian courser's frame the rider's length of limb the same long afterwards did scotland know fell edward was her deadliest foe twenty four the vision made our monarch start but soon he manned his noble heart and in the first career they ran the elfin knight fell horse and man yet did a splinter of his lance through alexander's visor glance and raised the skin a puny wound the king light leaping to the ground with naked blade his phantom foe compelled the future war to show of largs he saw the glorious plain where still gigantic bones remain memorial of the danish war himself he saw amid the field on high his brandished war-axe wield and strike proud haco from his car while all around the shadowy kings denmark's grim ravens cowered their wings tis said that in that awful night remoter visions met his sight foreshowing future conquest far when our sons sons wage northern war a royal city tower and spire reddened the midnight sky with fire and shouting crews her navy bore triumphant to the victor shore such signs may learned clerks explain they pass the wit of simple swain twenty five the joyful king turned home again headed his host and quelled the dane but yearly when returned the night of his strange combat with the sprite his wound must bleed and smart lord gifford then would gibing say bold as ye were my liege ye pay the penance of your start long since beneath dumferland's nave king alexander fills his grave our lady give him rest yet still the knightly spear and shield the elfin warrior doth wield upon the brown hill's breast and many a knight hath proved his chance in the charmed ring to break a lance but all have foully sped save two as legends tell and they were wallace white and gilbert hay gentles my tale is said twenty six the quakes were deep the liquor strong and on the tale the yeoman throng had made a comment sage and long but marmion gave a sign and with their lord the squires retire the rest around the hostel fire their drowsy limbs recline for pillow underneath each head the quiver and the targe were laid deep slumbering on the hostel floor oppressed with toil and ale they snore the dying flame in fitful change threw on the group its shadows strange twenty seven apart and nestling in the hay of a waste loft fitz eustace lay scarce by the pale moonlight were seen the foldings of his mantle green lightly he dreamt as youth will dream of sport by thicket or by stream 
of hawk or hound of ring or glove or lighter yet of lady's love a cautious tread his slumber broke and close beside him when he woke in moonbeam half and half in gloom stood a tall form with nodding plume but ere his dagger eustace drew his master marmion's voice he knew twenty eight fitz eustace rise i cannot rest yon churl's wild legend haunts my breast and graver thoughts have chafed my mood the air must cool my feverish blood and fain would i ride forth to see the scene of elfin chivalry arise and saddle me my steed and gentle eustace take good heed thou dost not rouse these drowsy slaves i would not that the prating knaves had cause for saying o'er their ale that i could credit such a tale then softly down the steps they slid eustace the stable door undid and darkling marmion's steed arrayed while whispering thus the baron said twenty nine didst never good my youth hear tell that on the hour when i was born saint george who graced my sire's chapelle down from his steed of marble fell a weary wight forlorn the flattering chaplains all agree the champion left his steed to me i would the omen's truth to show that i could meet this elfin foe blithe would i battle for the right to ask one question at the sprite vain thought for elves if elves there be an empty race by fount or sea to dashing waters dance and sing or round the green oak wheel their ring thus speaking he his steed bestrode and from the hostel slowly rode thirty fitz eustace followed him abroad and marked him pace the village road and listened to his horse's tramp till by the lessening sound he judged that of the pictish camp lord marmion sought the round wonder it seemed in the squire's eyes that one so wary held and wise of whom twas said he scarce received for gospel what the church believed should stirred by idle tale ride forth in silence of the night as hoping half to meet a sprite arrayed in plate and mail for little did fitz eustace know that passions in contending flow unfix the strongest mind wearied from doubt to doubt to flee we welcome fond credulity guide confident though blind thirty one little for this fitz eustace cared but patient waited till he heard at distance pricked to utmost speed the foot-tramp of a flying steed come townward rushing on first dead as if on turf it trod then clattering on the village road in other pace than forth he yode returned lord marmion down hastily he sprung from cell and in his haste well nigh he fell to the squire's hand the rein he threw and spoke no word as he withdrew but yet the moonlight did betray the falcon crest was soiled with clay and plainly might fitz eustace see by stains upon the charger's knee and his left side that on the moor he had not kept his footing sure long musing on these wondrous signs at length to rest the squire reclines broken and short for still between would dreams of terror intervene eustace did ne'er so blithely mark the first notes of the morning lark end of section six section seven of marmion a tale of flodden field by walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction to canto fourth to james skeen esq Ashestil, Ettrick Forest. An ancient minstrel sagely said, Where is the life which late we led? That motley clown in Arden Wood, whom humorous Jakes with envy viewed, not even that clown could amplify on this trite text so long as I. Eleven years we now may tell since we have known each other well, since riding side by side our hand first drew the voluntary brand and sure through many a varied scene unkindness never came between away these winged years have flown to join the mass of ages gone and though deep marked like all below with chequered shades of joy and woe though thou o'er realms and seas hast ranged marked cities lost and empires changed while here at home my narrower ken somewhat of manners saw and men though varying wishes hopes and fears fevered the progress of these years yet now days weeks and months but seem the recollection of a dream 
so still we glide down to the sea of fathomless eternity even now it scarcely seems a day since first i tuned this idle lay a task so often thrown aside when leisure graver cares denied that now november's dreary gale whose voice inspired my opening tale that same november gale once more whirls the dry leaves on yarrow shore their vexed boughs streaming to the sky once more our naked birches sigh and blackhouse heights and ettrick pen have donned their wintry shrouds again and mountain dark and flooded mead bid us forsake the banks of tweed earlier than wont along the sky mixed with the rack the snow mists fly the shepherd who in summer sun had something of our envy won as thou with pencil i with pen the features traced of hill and glen he who outstretched the livelong day at ease among the heath flowers lay viewed the light clouds with vacant look or slumbered o'er his tattered book or idly busied him to guide his angle o'er the lessened tide at midnight now the snowy plain finds sterner labour for the swain when red hath set the beamless sun through heavy vapours dark and dun when the tired ploughman dry and warm hears half asleep the rising storm hurling the hail and sleeted rain against the casement's tinkling pane the sounds that drive wild deer and fox to shelter in the brake and rocks are warnings which the shepherd ask to dismal and to dangerous task oft he looks forth and hopes in vain the blast may sink in mellowing rain till dark above and white below decided drives the flaky snow and forth the hardy swain must go long with dejected look and whine to leave the hearth his dogs repine whistling and cheering them to aid around his back he wreathed the plaid his flock he gathers and he guides to open downs and mountain sides where fiercest though the tempest blow least deeply lies the drift below the blast that whistles o'er the fells stiffens his locks to icicles oft he looks back while streaming far his cottage window seems a star loses its feeble gleam and then turns patient to the blast again and facing to the tempest's sweep drives through the gloom his lagging sheep if fails his heart if his limbs fail benumbing death is in the gale his paths his landmarks all unknown close to the hut no more his own close to the aid he sought in vain the morn may find the stiffened swain the widow sees at dawning pale his orphans raise their feeble wail and close beside him in the snow poor yarrow partner of their woe couches upon his master's breast and licks his cheek to break his rest who envies now the shepherd's lot his healthy fare his rural cot his summer couch by greenwood tree his rustic kern's loud revelry his native hill notes tuned on high to marion of the blithesome eye his crook his scrip his oaten reed and all arcadia's golden creed changes not so with us my skein of human life the varying scene our youthful summer oft we see dance by on wings of game and glee while the dark storm reserves its rage against the winter of our age as he the ancient chief of troy his manhood spent in peace and joy but grecian fires and loud alarms called ancient priam forth to arms then happy those since each must drain his share of pleasure share of pain then happy those beloved of heaven to whom the mingled cup is given whose lenient sorrows find relief whose joys are chastened by their grief and such a lot my scheme was thine when thou of late wert doomed to twine just when thy bridal hour was by the cypress with the myrtle tie just on thy bride her sire had smiled and blessed the union of his child when love must change its joyous cheer and wipe affection's filial tear nor did the actions next his end speak more the father than the friend scarce had lamented forbes paid the tribute to his minstrel's shade the tale of friendship scarce was told ere the narrator's heart was cold far may we search before we find a heart so manly and so kind but not around his honoured urn shall friends alone and kindred mourn the thousand eyes his care had dried pour at his name a bitter tide and frequent falls the grateful dew for benefits the world ne'er knew if mortal charity dare claim the almighty's attributed name inscribe above his mouldering clay the widow's shield the orphan's stay nor though it wake thy sorrow deem my verse intrudes on this sad theme 
for sacred was the pen that wrote thy father's friend forget thou not and grateful title may i plead for many a kindly word and deed to bring my tribute to his grave tis little but tis all i have to thee perchance this rambling strain recalls our summer walks again when doing naught and to speak true not anxious to find aught to do the wild unbounded hills we ranged while oft our talk its topic changed and desultory as our way ranged unconfined from grave to gay even when it flagged as oft will chance no effort made to break its trance we could right pleasantly pursue our sports in social silence too thou gravely labouring to portray the blighted oak's fantastic spray i spelling o'er with much delight the legend of that antique knight tyrant by name eclept the white at either's feet a trusty squire pandour and camp with eyes of fire jealous each other's motions viewed and scarce suppressed their ancient feud the laverock whistled from the cloud the stream was lively but not loud from the white thorn the mayflower shed its dewy fragrance round our head not ariel lived more merrily under the blossomed bough than we and blithesome nights too have been ours when winter stripped the summer's bowers careless we heard what now i hear the wild blast sighing deep and drear when fires were bright and lamps beamed gay and ladies tuned the lovely lay and he was held a laggard soul who shunned to quaff the sparkling bowl then he whose absence we deplore who breathes the gales of devon's shore the longer mist bewailed the more and thou and i and dear loved are and one whose name i may not say for not mimosa's tender tree shrinks sooner from the touch than he in merry chorus well combined with laughter drowned the whistling wind mirth was within and care without might gnaw her nails to hear our shout not but amid the buxom scene some grave discourse might intervene of the good horse that bore him best his shoulder hoof and arching crest for like mad toms our chiefest care was horse to ride and weapon wear such nights we've had and though the game of manhood be more sober tame and though the field day or the drill seem less important now yet still such may we hope to share again the sprightly thought inspires my strain and mark how like a horseman true lord marmion's march i thus renew end of section seven Section eight of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto fourth The Camp Eustace, I said, did blithely mark the first notes of the merry lark. The lark sang shrill, the cock he crew, and loudly Marmion's bugles blew, and with their light and lively call brought groom and yeoman to the stall whistling they came and free of heart but soon their mood was changed complaint was heard on every part of something disarranged some clamoured loud for armour lost some brawled and wrangled with the host by becket's bones cried one i fear that some false scot has stolen my spear young blount lord marmion's second squire found his steed wet with sweat and mire although the rated horse-boy swear last night he dressed him sleek and fair while chafed the impatient squire like thunder old hubert shouts in fear and wonder help gentle blunt help comrades all bevis lies dying in his stall to marmion who the plight dare tell of the good steed he loves so well gaping for fear and ruth they saw the charger panting on his straw till one who would seem wisest cried what else but evil could betide with that cursed palmer for our guide better we had through mire and bush been lantern led by friar rush two fitz eustace who the cause but guessed nor wholly understood his comrades clamorous plaints suppressed he knew lord marmion's mood him ere he issued forth he sought and found deep plunged in gloomy thought and did his tale display simply as if he knew of naught to cause such disarray lord marmion gave attention cold nor marvelled at the wonders told passed them as accidents of course and bade his clarions sound to horse three 
young henry blount meanwhile the cost had reckoned with their scottish host and as the charge he cast and paid ill thou deservest thy hire he said dost see thou knave my horse's plight fairies have ridden him all the night and left him in a foam i trust that soon a conjuring band with english cross and blazing brand shall drive the devils from this land to their infernal home for in this haunted den i trow all night they trampled to and fro the laughing host looked on the hire gramercy gentle southern squire and if thou comest among the rest with scottish broadsword to be blest sharp be the brand and sure the blow and short the pang to undergo here stayed their talk for marmion gave now the signal to set on the palmer showing forth the way they journeyed all the morning day four the greensward way was smooth and good through humbies and through sultan's wood a forest glade which varying still here gave a view of dale and hill there narrower closed till overhead a vaulted screen the branches made a pleasant path fitz eustace said such as where errant knights might see adventures of high chivalry might meet some damsel flying fast with hair unbound and looks aghast and smooth and level course were here in her defence to break a spear here too are twilight nooks and dells and oft in such the story tells the damsel kind from danger freed did grateful pay her champion's meed he spoke to cheer lord marmion's mind perchance to show his law designed for eustace much had poured upon a huge romantic tome in the hall window of his home imprinted at the antique dome of caxton or de ward therefore he spoke but spoke in vain for marmion answered naught again five now sudden distant trumpets shrill in notes prolonged by wood and hill were heard to echo far each ready archer grasped his bow but by the flourish soon they know they breathed no point of war yet cautious as in foeman's land lord marmion's order speeds the band some opener ground to gain and scarce a furlong had they rode when thinner trees receding showed a little woodland plain just in that advantageous glade the halting troop a line had made as forth from the opposing shade issued a gallant train six first came the trumpets at whose clang so late the forest echoes rang on prancing steeds they forward pressed with scarlet mantle azure vest each at his trump a banner wore which scotland's royal scutcheon bore heralds and poor servants by name bute eiley marchmount rothsay came in painted tabards proudly showing gules argent ore and azure glowing attendant on a king at arms whose hand the armorial truncheon held that feudal strife had often quelled when wildest its alarms seven he was a man of middle age in aspect manly grave and sage as on king's errand come but in the glances of his eye a penetrating keen and sly expression found its home the flash of that satiric rage which bursting on the early stage branded the vices of the age and broke the keys of rome on milk-white palfrey forth he paced his cap of maintenance was graced with the proud heron plume from his steed's shoulder loin and breast silk housings swept the ground with scotland's arms device and crest embroidered round and round the double treasure might you see first by Achaius born the thistle and the fleur-de-lis and gallant unicorn so bright the king's armorial coat that scarce the dazzled eye could note in living colours blazoned brave the lion which his title gave a train which well beseemed his state but all unarmed around him wait still is thy name in high account and still thy verse has charms sir david lindesey of the mount lord lion king at arms eight down from his horse did marmion spring soon as he saw the lion king for well the stately baron knew to him such courtesy was due whom royal james himself had crowned and on his temples placed the round of scotland's ancient diadem and wet his brow with hallowed wine and on his finger given to shine the emblematic gem their mutual greetings duly made the lion thus his message said though scotland's king hath deeply swore ne'er to knit faith with henry more and strictly hath forbid resort from england to his royal court yet for he knows lord marmion's name and honours much his warlike fame 
my liege hath deemed it shame and lack of courtesy to turn him back and by his order i your guide must lodging fit and fair provide till finds king james meet time to see the flower of english chivalry nine though inly chafed at this delay lord marmion bears it as he may the palmer his mysterious guide beholding thus his place supplied sought to take leave in vain strict was the lion king's command that none who rode in marmion's band should sever from the train england has here an hour of spies in lady heron's witching eyes to marchmount thus apart he said but fair pretext to marmion made the right-hand path they now decline and trace against the stream the time ten at length up that wild dale they wind where crichton castle crowns the bank for there the lion's care assigned a lodging meet for marmion's rank that castle rises on the steep of the green vale of time and far beneath where slow they creep from pool to eddy dark and deep where alders moist and willows weep you hear her streams repine the towers in different ages rose their various architecture shows the builders various hands a mighty mass that could oppose when deadliest hatred fired its foes the vengeful douglas bands eleven crichton though now thy miry court but pens the lazy steer and sheep thy turrets rude and tottered keep have been the minstrel's loved resort oft have i traced within thy fort of mouldering shields the mystic sense scutcheons of honour or pretence quartered in old armorial sort remains of rude magnificence nor wholly yet had time defaced thy lordly gallery fair nor yet the stony cord unbraced whose twisted knots with roses laced adorn thy ruined stair still rises unimpaired below the courtyard's graceful portico above its cornice row and row of fair hewn facets richly show their pointed diamond form though there but houseless cattle go to shield them from the storm and shuddering still may we explore where oft whilom were captives pent the darkness of thy massy moor or from thy grass-grown battlement may trace in undulating line the sluggish mazes of the time twelve another aspect crichton showed as through its portal marmion road but yet twas melancholy state received him at the outer gate for none were in the castle then but women boys or aged men with eyes scarce dried the sorrowing dame to welcome noble marmion came her son a stripling twelve years old proffered the baron's reign to hold for each man that could draw a sword had marched that morning with their lord earl adam hepburn he who died on flodden by his sovereign's side long may his lady look in vain she ne'er shall see his gallant train come sweeping back through crichton dean twas a brave race before the name of hated bothwell stained their fame thirteen and here two days did marmion rest with every right that honour claims attended as the king's own guest such the command of royal james who marshalled then his land's array upon the borough moor that lay perchance he would not foeman's eye upon his gathering host should pry till full prepared was every band to march against the english land here while they dwelt did lindesay's wit oft cheer the baron's moodier fit and in his turn he knew to prize lord marmion's powerful mind and wise trained in the law of rome and greece and policies of war and peace fourteen it chanced as fell the second night that on the battlements they walked and by the slowly fading light of varying topics talked and unaware the herald bard said marmion might his toil have spared in travelling so far for that a messenger from heaven in vain to james had counsel given against the english war and closer questioned thus he told a tale which chronicles of old in scottish story have enrolled fifteen sir david lindsay's tale of all the palaces so fair built for the royal dwelling in scotland far beyond compare linlithgow is excelling and in its park in jovial june how sweet the merry linnet's tune how blithe the blackbirds lay the wild buck bells from ferny break the coot dives merry on the lake the saddest heart might pleasure take to see all nature gay 
but june is to our sovereign dear the heaviest month in all the year too well his cause of grief you know june saw his father's overthrow woe to the traitors who could bring the princely boy against his king still in his conscience burns the sting in offices as strict as lent king james's june is ever spent sixteen when last this ruthful month was come and in linlithgow's holy dome the king as wont was praying while for his royal father's soul the chanters sung the bells did toll the bishop mass was saying for now the year brought round again the day the luckless king was slain in catherine's isle the monarch knelt with sackcloth shirt and iron belt and eyes with sorrow streaming around him in their stalls of state the thistle's night companions sat their banners o'er them beaming i too was there and sooth to tell bedeafened with the jangling knell was watching where the sunbeams fell through the stained casement gleaming but while i marked what next befell it seemed as i were dreaming stepped from the crowd a ghostly white in azure gown with cincture white his forehead bald his head was bare down hung at length his yellow hair now mock me not when good my lord i pledge to you my knightly word that when i saw his placid grace his simple majesty of face his solemn bearing and his pace so stately gliding on seemed to me ne'er did limna paint so just an image of the saint who propped the virgin in her faint the loved apostle john seventeen he stepped before the monarch's chair and stood with rustic plainness there and little reverence made nor head nor body bowed nor bent but on the desk his arm he leant and words like these he said in a low voice but never tone so thrilled through vein and nerve and bone my mother sent me from afar sir king to warn thee not to war woe waits on thine array if war thou wilt of woman fair her witching wiles and wanton snare james stuart doubly warned beware god keep thee as he may the wandering monarch seemed to seek for answer and found none and when he raised his head to speak the monitor was gone the marshal and myself had cast to stop him as he outward passed but lighter than the whirlwind's blast he vanished from our eyes like sunbeam on the billow cast that glances but and dies eighteen while lindsay told his marvel strange the twilight was so pale he marked not marmion's colour change while listening to the tale but after a suspended pause the baron spoke of nature's laws so strong i held the force that never superhuman cause could e'er control their course and three days since had judged your aim was but to make your guest your game but i have seen since past the tweed what much has changed my sceptic creed and made me credit aught he stayed and seemed to wish his words unsaid but by that strong emotion pressed which prompts us to unload our breast even when discoveries pain to lindesey did at length unfold the tale his village host had told at gifford to his train naught of the palmer says he there and naught of constance or of clare the thoughts which broke his sleep he seems to mention but as feverish dreams nineteen in vain said he to rest i spread my burning limbs and couched my head fantastic thoughts returned and by their wild dominion led my heart within me burned so sore was the delirious goad i took my steed and forth i rode and as the moon shone bright and cold soon reached the camp upon the wold the southern entrance i passed through and halted and my bugle blew methought an answer met my ear yet was the blast so low and drear so hollow and so faintly blown it might be echo of my own twenty thus judging for a little space i listened ere i left the place but scarce could trust my eyes nor yet can think they serve me true when sudden in the ring i view in form distinct of shape and hue a mounted champion rise i've fought lord lion many a day in single fight and mixed affray and ever i myself may say have borne me as a knight but when this unexpected foe seemed starting from the gulf below i care not though the truth i show 
I trembled with affright, and as I placed in rest my spear, my hand so shook for very fear, I scarce could couch it right. 21. Why need my tongue the issue tell? We ran our course, my charger fell. What could he against the shock of hell? I rolled upon the plain. High o'er my head, with threatening hand, the spectre shook his naked brand, yet did the worst remain. My dazzled eyes I upward cast, not opening hell itself could blast their sight like what I saw. Full on his face the moonbeam struck, a face could never be mistook, I knew the stern vindictive look, and held my breath for awe. I saw the face of one who, fled to foreign climes, has long been dead. I will believe the last. For ne'er from visor raised did stare a human warrior with a glare so grimly and so ghast. Thrice o'er my head he shook the blade, but when to good St. George I prayed, the first time ere I asked his aid, he plunged it in the sheath. And on his coarser mounting light he seemed to vanish from my sight. The moonbeam drooped, and deepest night sunk down upon the heath. T'were long to tell what cause I have to know his face that met me there, called by his hatred from the grave to cumber upper air. Dead or alive, good cause had he to be my mortal enemy. 22. Marvelled Sir David of the Mount, then learned in story gan recount such chance had happed of old. When once, near Norham, there did fight a spectre fell of fiendish might, in likeness of a Scottish knight, with Brian Bulmer bold, and trained him nigh to disallow the aid of his baptismal vow. And such a phantom toot is said, with highland broadsword, targe, and plaid, and fingers red with gore, is seen in Rothimurcus glade, or where the sable pine-tree shade, dark Tomantul, and Ochnas laid, Dromuchti, or Glenmore, and yet, Whate'er such legends say of warlike demon, ghost, or lay, on mountain, moor, or plain, spotless in faith, in bosom bold, true son of chivalry should hold these midnight terrors vain. For seldom have such spirits power to harm, save in the evil hour, when guilt we meditate within, or harbour unrepented sin. Lord Marmion turned him half aside, and twice to clear his voice he tried, then pressed Sir David's hand. But nought at length in answer said, And here their father converse stayed, Each ordering that his band Should bound them with the rising day To Scotland's camp to take their way. Such was the king's command. 23. Early they took Dunedin's road, And I could trace each step they trod. Hill, brook, nor dell, nor rock, nor stone Lies on the path to me unknown. Much might I boast of storied lore, but passing such digression o'er, suffice it that their route was laid across the furzy hills of Braid. They passed the glen and scanty rill, and climbed the opposing bank, until they gained the top of Blackford Hill. 24. Blackford, on whose uncultured breast, among the broom and thorn and whin, a truant boy, I sought the nest, or listed as I lay at rest, while rose on breezes thin the murmur of the city crowd, and from his steeple jangling loud St. Giles's mingling din. Now from the summit to the plain waves all the hill with yellow grain, and o'er the landscape as I look, nought do I see unchanged remain, save the rude cliffs and chiming brook. To me they make a heavy moan of early friendships past and gone. Twenty-five. But different far the change has been since Marmion from the crown of Blackford saw that martial scene upon the bent so brown. Thousand pavilions, white as snow, spread all the borough moor below, upland and dale and down. A thousand, did I say? I ween thousands on thousands there were seen that chequered all the heath between the streamlet and the town. In crossing ranks extending far, forming a camp irregular, oft giving way where still there stood some relics of the old oak wood that darkly huge did intervene and tamed the glaring white with green in these extended lines there lay a martial kingdom's vast array twenty six for from hebudes dark with rain to eastern lodon's fertile plain and from the southern red edge to farthest rossa's rocky ledge 
from west to east from south to north scotland sent all her warriors forth marmion might hear the mingled hum of myriads up the mountain come the horses tramp and tingling clank where chiefs reviewed their vassal rank and charges shrilling neigh and see the shifting lines advance while frequent flashed from shield and lance the sun's reflected ray twenty seven thin curling in the morning air the wreaths of failing smoke declare to embers now the brands decayed where the night watch their fires had made they saw slow rolling on the plain full many a baggage cart and wain and dire artillery's clumsy car by sluggish oxen tugged to war and there were borthwick's sisters seven and culverins which france had given ill-omened gift the guns remain the conqueror's spoil on flodden plain twenty eight nor marked they less where in the air a thousand streamers flaunted fair various in shape device and hue green sanguine purple red and blue broad narrow swallow-tailed and square scroll pennon pencil bandrol there o'er the pavilions flew highest and midmost was descried the royal banner floating wide the staff a pine tree strong and straight pitched deeply in a massive stone which still in memory is shown yet bent beneath the standard's weight whene'er the western wind unrolled with toil the huge and cumbrous fold and gave to view the dazzling field wherein proud scotland's royal shield the ruddy lion ramped in gold twenty nine lord marmion viewed the landscape bright he viewed it with a chief's delight until within him burned his heart and lightning from his eye did part as on the battle day such glance did falcon never dart when stooping on his prey o oh, well lord lion hast thou said thy king from warfare to dissuade were but a vain essay poor by st george were that host mine not power infernal nor divine should once to peace my soul incline till i had dimmed their armour's shine in glorious battle fray answered the bard of milder mood fair is the sight and yet twere good that kings should think withal when peace and wealth their land has blessed tis better to sit still at rest than rise perchance to fall thirty still on the spot lord marmion stayed for fairer scene he ne'er surveyed when sated with the martial show that peopled all the plain below the wandering eye could o'er it go and mark the distant city glow with gloomy splendour red for on the smoke wreaths huge and slow that round her sable turrets flow the morning beams were shed and tinged them with a lustre proud like that which streaks a thunder-cloud such dusky grandeur clothed the height where the huge castle holds its state and all the steep slope down whose ridgy back heaves to the sky piled deep and massy close and high mine own romantic town but northward far with purer blaze on ockle mountains fell the rays and as each heathy top they kissed it gleamed a purple amethyst yonder the shores of fife you saw here preston bay and berwick law and broad between them rolled the gallant frith the eye might note whose islands on its bosom float like emeralds chased in gold fitz eustace's heart felt closely pent as if to give his rapture vent the spur he to his charger lent and raised his bridle hand and making demi vault in air cried where's the coward that would not dare to fight for such a land the lindsay smiled his joy to see nor marmion's frown repressed his glee thirty one thus while they looked a flourish proud where mingled trump and clarion loud and fife and kettle drum and sack but deep and psaltery and war-pipe with discordant cry and cymbal clattering to the sky making wild music bold and high did up the mountain come the whilst the bells with distant chime merrily told the hour of prime and thus the lindsay spoke thus clamour still the war notes when the king to mass his way has ta'en or to st catherine's of sienne or chapel of st roch to you they speak of martial fame but me remind of peaceful game when blither was their cheer thrilling in falkland woods the air in signal none his steed should spare but strive which foremost might repair to the downfall of the deer thirty two 
nor less he said when looking forth i view yon empress of the north sit on her hilly throne her palace's imperial bowers her castle proof to hostile powers her stately halls and holy towers nor less he said i moan to think what woe mischance may bring and how these merry bells may ring the death dirge of our gallant king or with the larum call the burghers forth to watch and ward gainst southern sack and fires to guard dun eden's leaguered wall but not for my presaging thought dream conquest sure or cheaply bought lord marmion i say nay god is the guider of the field he breaks the champion's spear and shield but thou thyself shalt say when joins yon host in deadly star that england's dames must weep in bower her monks the death mass sing for never saw'st thou such a power led on by such a king and now down winding to the plain the barriers of the camp they gain and there they made a stay there stays the minstrel till he fling his hand o'er every border string and fit his harp the pomp to sing of scotland's ancient court and king in the succeeding lay end of section eight section nine of marmion a tale of flodden field by walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction to canto fifth to george ellis esq edinburgh when dark december glooms the day and takes our autumn joys away when short and scant the sunbeam throws upon the weary waste of snows a cold and profitless regard like patron on a needy bard when sylvan occupations done and o'er the chimney rests the gun and hang in idle trophy near the game pouch fishing rod and spear when wiry terrier rough and grim and greyhound with his length of limb and pointer now employed no more cumber our parlour's narrow floor when in his stall the impatient steed is long condemned to rest and feed when from our snow encircled home scarce cares the hardiest step to roam since path is none save that to bring the needful water from the spring when wrinkled newspage thrice conned o'er beguiles the dreary hour no more and darkling politician crossed inveighs against the lingering post and answering housewife sore complains of carrier's snow impeded wains when such the country cheer i come well pleased to seek our city home for converse and for books to change the forest's melancholy range and welcome with renewed delight the busy day and social night not here need my desponding rhyme lament the ravages of time as erst by newark's riven towers and ettrick stripped of forest bowers true caledonia's queen is changed since on her dusky summit ranged within its steepy limits pent by bulwark line and battlement and flanking towers and lakey flood guarded and garrisoned as she stood denying entrance or resort save at each tall embattled port above whose arch suspended hung portcullis spiked with iron prong that long is gone but not so long since early closed and opening late jealous revolved the studded gate whose task from eve to morning tide a wicket churlishly supplied stern then and steel-girt was thy brow dun eden oh how altered now when safe amid thy mountain court thou sitst like empress at her sport and liberal unconfined and free flinging thy white arms to the sea for thy dark cloud with umbered lower that hung o'er cliff and lake and tower thou gleamst against the western ray ten thousand lines of brighter day not she the championess of old in spencer's magic tale enrolled she for the charmed spear renowned which forced each knight to kiss the ground not she more changed when placed at rest what time she was malbecco's guest she gave to flow her maiden vest when from the corslet's grasp relieved free to the sight her bosom heaved sweet was her blue eyes modest smile erst hidden by the aventile and down her shoulders graceful rolled her locks profuse of paly gold they who while in midnight fight had marvelled at her matchless might no less her maiden charms approved but looking liked and liking loved the sight could jealous pangs beguile and charm malbecco's cares awhile and he the wandering squire of dames forgot his columbella's claims and passion erst unknown could gain the breast of blunt so saturnine 
nor durst light paradel advance bold as he was a looser glance she charmed at once and tamed the heart incomparable brighter main so thou fair city disarrayed of battled wall and rampart's aid as stately seemst but lovelier far than in that panoply of war nor deem that from thy fenceless throne strength and security have flown still as of yore queen of the north still canst thou send thy children forth ne'er readier at alarm bells call thy burghers rose to man thy wall than now in danger shall be thine thy dauntless voluntary line for foss and turret proud to stand their breasts the bulwarks of the land thy thousands trained to martial toil full red would stain their native soil ere from thy mural crown there fell the slightest nosp or pinnacle and if it come as come it may dun that eventful day renowned for hospitable deed that virtue much with heaven may plead in patriarchal times whose care descending angels deigned to share that claim may wrestle blessings down on those who fight for the good town destined in every age to be refuge of injured royalty since first when conquering york arose to henry meek she gave repose till late with wonder grief and awe great bourbon's relics sad she saw truce to these thoughts for as they rise how gladly i avert mine eyes bodings or true or false to change for fiction's fair romantic range or for tradition's dubious light that hovers twixt the day and night dazzling alternately and dim her wavering lamp i'd rather trim knights squires and lovely dames to see creation of my fantasy than gaze abroad on reeky fen and make of mists invading men who loves not more the night of june than dull december's gloomy noon the moonlight than the fog of frost but can we say which cheats the most but who shall teach my harp to gain a sound of the romantic strain whose anglo-norman tones while ear could win the royal henry's ear famed beauclerk called for that he loved the minstrel and his lay approved who shall these lingering notes redeem decaying on oblivion's stream such notes as from the breton tongue marie translated blondel sung o oh, born time's ravage to repair and make the dying muse thy care who when his scythe her hoary foe was poising for the final blow the weapon from his hand could wring and break his glass and shear his wing and bid reviving in his strain the gentle poet live again thou who canst give to lightest lay an unpedantic moral gay nor less the dullest theme bid flit on wings of unexpected wit in letters as in life approved example honoured and beloved dear ellis to the bard impart a lesson of thy magic art to win at once the head and heart at once to charm instruct and mend my guide my pattern and my friend such minstrel lesson to bestow be long thy pleasing task but oh no more by thy example teach what few can practice all can preach with even patience to endure lingering disease and painful cure and boast affliction's pangs subdued by mild and manly fortitude enough the lesson has been given forbid the repetition heaven come listen then for thou hast known and loved the minstrel's varying tone who like his border sires of old waked a wild measure rude and bold till windsor's oaks and ascot plain with wonder heard the northern strain come listen bold in thy applause the bard shall scorn pedantic laws and as the ancient art could stain achievements on the storied pain irregularly traced and planned but yet so glowing and so grand so shall he strive in changeful hue field feast and combat to renew and loves and arms and harper's glee and all the pomp of chivalry end of section nine section ten of marmion a tale of flodden field by walter scott this librivox recording is in the public domain canto fifth the court one the train has left the hills of braid the barrier guard have open made so lindsay bad the palisade that closed the tented ground their men the warders backward drew and carried pikes as they rode through into its ample bound fast ran the scottish warriors there upon the southern band to stare 
and envy with their wonder rose to see such well-appointed foes such length of shafts such mighty bows so huge that many simply thought but for a vaunt such weapons wrought and little deemed their force to feel through links of mail and plates of steel when rattling upon flod and veil the cloth-yard arrows flew like hail two nor less did marmion's skilful view glance every line and squadron through and much he marvelled one small land could marshal forth such various band for men-at-arms were here heavily sheathed in mail and plate like iron towers for strength and weight on flemish steeds of bone and height with battle-axe and spear young knights and squires a lighter train practised their charges on the plain by aid of leg of hand and rein each warlike feat to show to pass to wheel the croup to gain and high curvet that not in vain the sword sway might descend amain on foeman's cask below he saw the hardy burghers there march armed on foot with faces bare for visor they wore none nor waving plume nor crest of knight but burnished were their corslets bright their brigantines and gorgets light like very silver shone long pikes they had for standing fight two-handed swords they wore and many wielded mace of weight and bucklers bright they bore three on foot the yeoman too but dressed in his steel jack a swarthy vest with iron quilted well each at his back a slender store his forty days provision bore as feudal statutes tell his arms were halbert axe or spear a crossbow there a hagbutt there a dagger knife and brand sober he seemed and sad of cheer as loath to leave his cottage dear and march to foreign strand or musing who would guide his steer to till the fallow land yet deem not in his thoughtful eye did aught of dastard terror lie more dreadful far his ire than theirs who scorning danger's name in eager mood to battle came their valour like light straw on name a fierce but fading fire four not so the borderer bred to war he knew the battle's din afar and joyed to hear it swell his peaceful day was slothful ease nor harp nor pipe his ear could please like the loud slogan yell on active steed with lance and blade the light-armed pricker plied his trade let nobles fight for fame let vassals follow where they lead burghers to guard their townships bleed but war's the borderer's game their gain their glory their delight to sleep the day maraud the night o'er mountain moss and moor joyful to fight they took their way scarce caring who might win the day their booty was secure these as lord marmion's train passed by looked on at first with careless eye nor marvelled aught well taught to know the form and force of english bow but when they saw the lord arrayed in splendid arms and rich brocade each borderer to his kinsman said hist ringen seest thou there canst guess which road they'll homeward ride oh could we but on border side by eusdale glen or liddell's tide be set a prize so fair that fangless lion too their guide might chance to lose his glistering hide brown maudlin of that doublet pied could make a kirtle rare five next marmion marked the celtic race of different language form and face a various race of man just then the chiefs their tribes arrayed and wild and garish semblance made the chequered trues and belted plaid and varying notes the war-pipes braid to every varying clan wild through their red or sable hair looked out their eyes with savage stare on marmion as he passed their legs above the knee were bare their frame was sinewy short and spare and hardened to the blast of taller race the chiefs they own were by the eagle's plumage known the hunted red deer's undressed hide their hairy buskins well supplied the graceful bonnet decked their head back from their shoulders hung the plaid a broadsword of unwieldy length a dagger proved for edge and strength a studded targe they wore and quivers bows and shafts but oh short was the shaft and weak the bow to that which england bore the isles men carried at their backs the ancient danish battle-axe they raised a wild and wondering cry as with his guide rode marmion by loud were their clamouring tongues as when the clanging sea-fowl leave the fen and with their cries discordant mixed grumbled and yelled the pipes betwixt six thus through the scottish camp they passed and reached the city gate at last 
where all around a wakeful guard armed burghers kept their watch and ward well had they cause of jealous fear when lay encamped in fields so near the borderer and the mountaineer as through the bustling streets they go all was alive with martial show at every turn with dinning clang the armourer's anvil clashed and rang or toiled the swarthy smith to wheel the bar that arms the charger's heel or axe or falchion to the side of jarring grindstone was applied page groom and squire with hurrying pace through street and lane and market-place bore lance or cask or sword while burghers with important face described each new-come lord discussed his lineage told his name his following and his warlike fame the lion led to lodging meet which high o'er looked the crowded street there must the baron rest till past the hour of vesper tide and then to holy rood must ride such was the king's behest meanwhile the lion's care assigns a banquet rich and costly wines to marmion and his train and when the appointed hour succeeds the baron dons his peaceful weeds and following lindsay as he leads the palace halls they gain seven old holy rood rung merrily that night with wassail mirth and glee king james within her princely bower feasted the chiefs of scotland's power summoned to spend the parting hour for he had charged that his array should southward march by break of day well loved that splendid monarch i the banquet and the song by day the tourney and by night the merry dance traced fast and light the maskers quaint the pageant bright the revel loud and long this feast outshone his banquets past it was his blithest and his last the dazzling lamps from gallery gay cast on the court a dancing ray here to the harp did minstrels sing their ladies touched a softer string with long-eared cap and motley vest the licensed fool retailed his jest his magic tricks the juggler plied at dice and draughts the gallants vied while some in close recess apart courted the ladies of their heart nor courted them in vain for often in the parting hour victorious love asserts his power or coldness and disdain and flinty is her heart can view to battle march a lover true can hear perchance his last adieu nor own her share of pain eight through this mixed crowd of glee and game the king to greet lord marmion came while reverent all made room an easy task it was i trow king james's manly form to know although his courtesy to show he doffed to marmion bending low his broidered cap and plume for royal was his garb and mien his cloak of crimson velvet piled trimmed with the fur of marten wild his vest of changeful satin sheen the dazzled eye beguiled his gorgeous collar hung adown wrought with the badge of scotland's crown the thistle brave of old renown his trusty blade toledo right descended from a baldric bright white were his buskins on the heel his spurs inlaid of gold and steel his bonnet all of crimson fair was buttoned with a ruby rare and marmion deemed he ne'er had seen a prince of such a noble mien nine the monarch's form was middle size for feet of strength or exercise shaped in proportion fair and hazel was his eagle eye and auburn of the darkest dye his short curled beard and hair light was his footstep in the dance and firm his stirrup in the lists and oh he had that merry glance that seldom lady's heart resists lightly from fair to fair he flew and loved to plead lament and sue suit lightly won and short-lived pain for monarchs seldom sigh in vain i said he joyed in banquet bower but mid his mirth twas often strange how suddenly his cheer would change his look or cast and lower if in a sudden turn he felt the pressure of his iron belt that bound his breast in penance pain in memory of his father's slain even so it was strange how evermore soon as the passing pang was o'er forward he rushed with double glee into the stream of revelry thus dim seen object of a fright startles the courser in his flight and half he halts half springs aside but feels the quickening spur applied and straining on the tightened rein scours doubly swift o'er hill and plain Ten. o'er james's heart the courtiers say sir hugh the heron's wife held sway to scotland's court she came to be a hostage for her lord who cessford's gallant heart had gored and with the king to make accord had sent his lovely dame nor to that lady free alone did the gay king allegiance own 
for the fair queen of france sent him a turquoise ring and glove and charged him as her knight and love for her to break a lance and strike three strokes with scottish brand and march three miles on southron land and bid the banners of his band in english breezes dance and thus for france's queen he dressed his manly limbs in mail and vest and thus admitted english fair his inmost counsel still to share and thus for both he madly planned the ruin of himself and land and yet the sooth to tell nor england's fair nor france's queen were worth one pearl drop bright and sheen from margaret's eyes that fell his own queen margaret who in lithgow's bower all lonely sat and wept the weary hour eleven the queen sits lone in lithgow pile and weeps the weary day the war against her native soil her monarch's risk in battle broil and in gay holy rood the while dame heron rises with a smile upon the harp to play fair was her rounded arm as o'er the strings her fingers flew and as she touched and tuned them all ever her bosom's rise and fall was plainer given to view for all for heat was laid aside her wimple and her hood untied and first she pitched her voice to sing then glanced her dark eye on the king and then around the silent ring and laughed and blushed and oft did say her pretty oath by yea and nay she could not would not durst not play at length upon the harp with glee mingled with arch simplicity a soft yet lively air she rung while thus the wily lady sung twelve lochinvar lady heron's song o young lochinvar is come out of the west through all the wide border his steed was the best and save his good broadsword he weapons had none he rode all unarmed and he rode all alone so faithful in love and so dauntless in war there never was knight like the young lochinvar he stayed not for break and he stopped not for stone he swam the esk river where ford there was none but ere he alighted at netherby gate the bride had consented the gallant came late for a laggard in love and a dastard in war was to wed the fair ellen of brave lochinvar so boldly he entered the netherby hall among bridesmen and kinsmen and brothers and all then spoke the bride's father his hand on his sword for the poor craven bridegroom said never a word o oh, come ye in peace here or come ye in war or to dance at our bridal young lord lochinvar i long wooed your daughter my suit you denied love swells like the solway but ebbs like its tide and now am i come with this lost love of mine to lead but one measure drink one cup of wine there are maidens in scotland more lovely by far that would gladly be bride to the young lochinvar the bride kissed the goblet the knight took it up he quaffed off the wine and he threw down the cup she looked down to blush and she looked up to sigh with a smile on her lips and a tear in her eye he took her soft hand ere her mother could bar now tread we a measure said young lochinvar so stately his form and so lovely her face that never a hall such a galliard did grace while her mother did fret and her father did fume and the bridegroom stood dangling his bonnet and plume and the bride maidens whispered twere better by far to have matched our fair cousin with young lochinvar one touch to her hand and one word in her ear when they reached the hall door and the charger stood near so light to the croup the fair lady he swung so light to the saddle before her he sprung she is won we are gone over bank bush and scar they'll have fleet steeds that follow quoth young lochinvar there was mounting mung grahams of the netherby clan forsters fenwicks and musgraves they rode and they ran there was racing and chasing on canaby lee but the lost bride of netherby ne'er did they see so daring in love and so dauntless in war have ye e'er heard of gallant like young lochinvar thirteen the monarch o'er the siren hung and beat the measure as she sung and pressing closer and more near he whispered praises in her ear in loud applause the courtiers vied and ladies winked and spoke aside the witching dame to marmion threw a glance where seemed to reign the pride that claims applauses due and of her royal conquest too a real or feigned disdain familiar was the look and told marmion and she were friends of old 
the king observed their meeting eyes with something like displeased surprise for monarch's ill can rivals brook even in a word or smile or look straight took he forth the parchment broad which marmion's high commission showed our borders sacked by many a raid our peaceful liegemen robbed he said on day of truce our warden slain stout barton killed his vassals ta'en unworthy were we here to reign should these for vengeance cry in vain our full defiance hate and scorn our herald has to henry born fourteen he paused and led where douglas stood and with stern eye the pageant viewed i mean that douglas sixth of yore who coronet of angus bore and when his blood and heart were high did the third james in camp defy and all his minions led to die on lauder's dreary flat princes and favourites long grew tame and trembled at the homely name of archibald bell the cat the same who left the dusky vale of hermitage in liddesdale its dungeons and its towers where bothwell's turrets brave the air and bothwell bank is blooming fair to fix his princely bowers though now in age he had laid down his armour for the peaceful gown and for a staff his brand yet often would flash forth the fire that could in youth a monarch's ire and minion's pride withstand and even that day at council board unapt to soothe his sovereign's mood against the war had angus stood and chafed his royal lord fifteen his giant form like ruined tower though fallen its muscles brawny vaunt huge boned and tall and grim and gaunt seemed o'er the gaudy scene to lower his locks and beard in silver grew his eyebrows kept their sable hue near douglas when the monarch stood his bitter speech he thus pursued lord marmion since these letters say that in the north you needs must stay while slightest hopes of peace remain uncourteous speech it were and stern to say return to lindisfarne until my herald come again then rest you in tantal and hold your host shall be the douglas bold a chief unlike his sires of old he wears their motto on his blade their blazon o'er his towers displayed yet loves his sovereign to oppose more than to face his country's foes and i bethink me by saint stephen but in this morn to me was given a prize the first fruits of the war ta'en by a galley from dunbar a bevy of the maids of heaven under your guard these holy maids shall safe return to cloister shades and while they at tantalon stay requiem for cochran's soul may say and with the slaughtered favourite's name across the monarch's brow there came a cloud of ire remorse and shame sixteen in answer nought could angus speak his proud heart swelled well nigh to break he turned aside and down his cheek a burning tear there stole his hand the monarch sudden took that sight his kind heart could not brook now by the bruce's soul angus my hasty speech forgive for sure as doth his spirit live as he said of the douglas old i well may say of you that never king did subject hold in speech more free in war more bold more tender and more true forgive me douglas once again and while the king his hand did strain the old man's tears fell down like rain to seize the moment marmion tried and whispered to the king aside oh let such tears unwonted plead for respite short from dubious deed a child will weep a bramble's smart a maid to see her sparrow part a stripling for a woman's heart but woe awaits a country when she sees the tears of bearded men then oh what omen dark and high when douglas wets his manly eye seventeen displeased was james that stranger viewed and tampered with his changing mood laugh those that can weep those that may thus did the fiery monarch say southward i march by break of day and if within tantalon strong the good lord marmion tarries long perchance our meeting next may fall at tamworth in his castle hall the haughty marmion felt the taunt and answered grave the royal vaunt much honoured were my humble home if in its halls king james should come but nottingham has archers good and yorkshire men are stern of mood northumbrian prickers wild and rude on derby hills the paths are steep in ooze and tyne the fords are deep and many a banner will be torn and many a knight to earth be borne and many a sheaf of arrows spent ere scotland's king shall cross the trent yet pause brave prince while yet you may 
the monarch lightly turned away and to his nobles loud did call lords to the dance a hall a hall himself his cloak and sword flung by and led dame heron gallantly and minstrels at the royal order rung out blue bonnets o'er the border eighteen leave we these revels now to tell what to st hilda's maids befell whose galley as they sailed again to whitby by a scot was ta'en now at duneden did they bide till james should of their fate decide and soon by his command were gently summoned to prepare to journey under marmion's care as escort honoured safe and fair again to english land the abbess told her chaplet o'er nor knew which saint she should implore for when she thought of constance saw she feared lord marmion's mood and judge what clara must have felt the sword that hung in marmion's belt had drunk to wilton's blood unwittingly king james had given as guard to whitby's shades the man most dreaded under heaven by these defenceless maids yet what petition could avail or who would listen to the tale of woman prisoner and nun mid bustle of a war begun they deemed it hopeless to avoid the convoy of their dangerous guide nineteen their lodging so the king assigned to marmions as their guardian joined and thus it fell that passing nigh the palmer caught the abbess's eye who warned him by a scroll she had a secret to reveal that much concerned the church's weal and health of sinner's soul and with deep charge of secrecy she named a place to meet within an open balcony that hung from dizzy pitch and high above the stately street to which as common to each home at night they might in secret come twenty at night in secret there they came the palmer and the holy dame the moon among the clouds rose high and all the city hum was by upon the street where late before did din of war and warriors roar you might have heard a pebble fall a beetle hum a cricket sing an owlet flap its boding wing on giles's steeple tall the antique buildings climbing high whose gothic frontlets sought the sky were here wrapped deep in shade there on their brows the moonbeam broke through the faint wreaths of silvery smoke and on the casements played and other light was none to see save torches gliding far before some chieftain of degree who left the royal revelry to bound him for the war a solemn scene the abbess chose a solemn hour her secret to disclose twenty one o holy palmer she began for sure he must be sainted man whose blessed feet have trod the ground where the redeemer's tomb is found for his dear church's sake my tale attend nor deem of light avail though i must speak of worldly love how vain to those who wed above to wilton and lord marmion wooed clara de clare of gloucester's blood idle it were of whitby's dame to say of that same blood i came and once when jealous rage was high lord marmion said despiteously wilton was traitor in his heart and had made league with martin swart when he came here on simnel's part and only cowardice did restrain his rebel aid on stokefield's plain and down he threw his glove the thing was tried as wont before the king where frankly did de wilton own that swart in gelders he had known and that between them then there went some scroll of courteous compliment for this he to his castle sent but when his messenger returned judge how de wilton's fury burned for in his packet there were laid letters that claimed disloyal aid and proved king henry's cause betrayed his fame thus blighted in the field he strove to clear by spear and shield to clear his fame in vain he strove for wondrous are his ways above perchance some form was unobserved perchance in prayer or faith he swerved else how could guiltless champion quail or how the blessed ordeal fail twenty two his squire who now de wilton saw as recreant doomed to suffer law repentant owned in vain that while he had the scrolls in care a stranger maiden passing fair had drenched him with a beverage rare his words no faith could gain with clare alone he credence won who rather than wed marmion did to st hilda's shrine repair to give our house her livings fair and die a vestal votress there the impulse from the earth was given but bent her to the paths of heaven a purer heart a lovelier maid ne'er sheltered her in whitby's shade no not since saxon edel fled only one trace of earthly strain that for her lover's loss 
she cherishes a sorrow vain and murmurs at the cross and then her heritage it goes along the banks of tame deep fields of grain the reaper mows in meadows rich the heifer lows the falconer and huntsman knows its woodlands for the game shame were it to st hilda dear and i her humble votress here should do a deadly sin her temple spoiled before mine eyes if this false marmion such a prize by my consent should win yet hath our boisterous monarch sworn that clare shall from our house be torn and grievous cause have i to fear such mandate doth lord marmion bear twenty three now prisoner helpless and betrayed to evil power i claim thine aid by every step that thou hast trod to holy shrine and grotto dim by every martyr's tortured limb by angel saint and seraphim and by the church of god for mark when wilton was betrayed and with his squire forged letters laid she was alas that sinful maid by whom the deed was done oh shame and horror to be said she was a perjured nun no clerk in all the land like her traced quaint and varying character perchance you may a marvel deem that marmion's paramour for such vile thing she was should scheme her lover's nuptial hour but o'er him thus she hoped to gain as privy to his honour's stain illimitable power for this she secretly retained each proof that might the plot reveal instructions with his hand and seal and thus st hilda deigned through sinner's perfidy impure her house's glory to secure and clare's immortal weal twenty four twere long and needless here to tell how to my hand these papers fell with me they must not stay st hilda keep her abbess true who knows what outrage he might do while journeying by the way o oh, blessed saint if e'er again i venturous leave thy calm domain to travel or by land or main deep penance may i pay now saintly palmer mark my prayer i give this packet to thy care for thee to stop they will not dare and o oh, with cautious speed to wolsey's hand the papers bring that he may show them to the king and for thy well-earned meed thou holy man at whitby's shrine a weekly mass shall still be thine while priests can sing and read what ail'st thou speak for as he took the charge a strong emotion shook his frame and ere reply they heard a faint yet shrilly tone like distant clarion feebly blown that on the breeze did die and loud the abbess shrieked in fear saint withold save us what is here look at yon city cross see on its battled tower appear phantoms that scutcheons seem to rear and blazoned banners toss twenty five Dunedin's cross, a pillared stone, rose on a turret octagon. But now is raised that monument whence royal edict rang, and voice of Scotland's law was sent in glorious trumpet clang. Oh, be his tomb as lead to lead upon its dull destroyer's head. A minstrel's malison is said. Then on its battlements they saw a vision passing nature's law, strange, wild, and dimly seen. Figures that seemed to rise and die, gibber and sign advance and fly while naught confirmed could ear or eye discern of sound or mien yet darkly did it seem as there heralds and pursuivants prepare with trumpet sound and blazon fair a summons to proclaim but indistinct the pageant proud as fancy forms of midnight cloud when flings the moon upon her shroud a wavering tinge of flame it flits expands and shifts till loud from midmost of the spectre crowd this awful summons came Twenty six. Prince, prelate, potentate, and peer, whose names I now shall call, Scottish or foreigner, give ear, subjects of him who sent me here at his tribunal to appear, I summon one and all. I cite you by each deadly sin that e'er hath soiled your hearts within, I cite you by each brutal lust that e'er defiled your earthly dust, by wrath, by pride, by fear by each o'ermastering passion's tone by the dark grave and dying groan when forty days are past and gone i cite you at your monarch's throne to answer and appear then thundered forth a roll of names the first was thine unhappy james then all thy nobles came crawford glencairn montrose argyle ross bothwell forbes lennox lyle why should i tell their separate style each chief of birth and fame of lowland highland border isle foredoomed to flodden's carnage pile was cited there by name 
and marmion lord of fontenay of lutterwood and scrivel bay de wilton erst of abelay the self-same thundering voice did say but then another spoke thy fatal summons i deny and thine infernal lord defy appealing me to him on high who burst the sinner's yoke at that dread accent with a scream parted the pageant like a dream the summoner was gone prone on her face the abbess fell and fast and fast her beads did tell her nuns came startled by the yell and found her there alone she marked not at the scene aghast what time or how the palmer passed twenty seven shift we the scene the camp doth move duneden's streets are empty now save when for weal of those they love to pray the prayer and vow the vow the tottering child the anxious fair the grey-haired sire with pious care to chapels and to shrines repair where is the palmer now and where the abbess marmion and clare bold douglas to tantallon fair they journey in thy charge lord marmion rode on his right hand the palmer still was with the band angus like lindsay did command that none should roam at large but in that palmer's altered mien a wondrous change might now be seen freely he spoke of war of marvels wrought by single hand when lifted for a native land and still looked high as if he planned some desperate deed afar his courser would he feed and stroke and tucking up his sable frock would first his metal bold provoke then soothe or quell his pride old hubert said that never one he saw except lord marmion a steed so fairly ride twenty eight some half hours march behind there came by eustace governed fair a troop escorting hilda's dame with all her nuns and clare no audience had lord marmion sought ever he feared to aggravate clara de clare's suspicious hate and safe it was he thought to wait till from the nuns removed the influence of kinsmen loved and suit by henry's self approved her slow consent had wrought his was no flickering flame that dies unless when fanned by looks and sighs and lighted oft at ladies eyes he longed to stretch his wide command o'er luckless clara's ample land besides when wilton with him vied although the pang of humbled pride the place of jealousy supplied yet conquest by that meanness won he almost loathed to think upon led him at times to hate the cause which made him burst through honour's laws if e'er he loved twas her alone who died within that vault of stone twenty nine and now when close at hand they saw north berwick's town and lofty law fitz eustace bade them pause a while before a venerable pile whose turrets viewed afar the lofty bass the lamby isle the ocean's peace or war at tolling of a bell forth came the convent's venerable dame and prayed st hilda's abbess rest with her a loved and honoured guest till douglas should a bark prepare to wait her back to whitby fair glad was the abbess you may guess and thanked the scottish prioress and tedious were to tell i ween the courteous speech that passed between or joyed the nuns their palfreys leave but when fair clara did intend like them from horseback to descend fitz eustace said i grieve fair lady grieve e'en from my heart such gentle company to part think not discourtesy but lord's commands must be obeyed and marmion and the douglas said that you must wend with me lord marmion hath a letter broad which to the scottish earl he showed commanding that beneath his care without delay you shall repair to your good kinsman lord fitzclair thirty the startled abbess loud exclaimed but she at whom the blow was aimed grew pale as death and cold as lead she deemed she heard her death doom read cheer thee my child the abbess said they dare not tear thee from my hand to ride alone with armoured band nay holy mother nay fitz eustace said the lovely clare will be in lady angus's care in scotland while we stay and when we move an easy ride will bring us to the english side female attendants to provide befitting gloucester's heir nor thinks nor dreams my noble lord by slightest look or act or word to harass lady clare her faithful guardian he will be nor sue for slightest courtesy that e'en to stranger falls till he shall place her safe and free within her kinsman's halls he spoke and blushed with earnest grace his faith was painted on his face and clare's worst fear relieved the lady abbess loud exclaimed on henry and the douglas blamed entreated threatened grieved 
to martyr saint and prophet prayed against lord marmion invade and called the prioress to aid to curse with candle bell and book her head the grave cistercian shook the douglas and the king she said in their commands will be obeyed grieve not nor dream that harm can fall the maiden in tantallon hall thirty one the abbess seeing strife was vain assumed her wonted state again for much of state she had composed her veil and raised her head and bid in solemn voice she said thy master bold and bad the records of his house turn o'er and when he shall there written see that one of his own ancestry drove the monks forth of coventry bid him his fate explore prancing in pride of earthly trust his charger hurled him to the dust and by a base plebeian thrust he died his band before god judge twixt marmion and me he is a chief of high degree and i a poor recluse yet oft in holy writ we see even such weak minister as me may the oppressor bruise for thus inspired did judith slay the mighty in his sin and jael thus and deborah here hasty blount broke in fitz eustace we must march our band st anton fire thee wilt thou stand all day with bonnet in thy hand to hear the lady preach by this good light if thus we stay lord marmion for our fond delay will sharper sermon teach come don thy cap and mount thy horse the dame must patience take perforce thirty two submit we then to force said clare but let this barbarous lord despair his purposed aim to win let him take living land and life but to be marmion's wedded wife in me were deadly sin and if it be the king's decree that i must find no sanctuary in that inviolable dome where even a homicide might come and safely rest his head though at its open portal stood thirsting to pour forth blood for blood the kinsmen of the dead yet one asylum is my own against the dreaded hour a low a silent and alone where kings have little power one victim is before me there mother your blessing and in prayer remember your unhappy clare loud weeps the abbess and bestows kind blessings many a one weeping and wailing loud arose round patient clare the clamorous woes of every simple nun his eyes the gentle eustace tried and scarce rude blount the sight could abide then took the squire her rein and gently led away her steed and by each courteous word and deed to cheer her strove in vain thirty three but scant three miles the band had rode when o'er a height they passed and sudden close before them showed his towers tantalon vast broad massive high and stretching far and held impregnable in war on a projecting rock they rose and round three sides the ocean flows the fourth did battled walls enclose and doubled mound and foss by narrow drawbridge outworks strong through studded gates an entrance long to the main court they cross it was a wide and stately square around were lodgings fit and fair and towers of various form which on the court projected far and broke its lines quadrangular here was square keep there turret high or pinnacle that sought the sky whence oft the warder could descry the gathering ocean storm thirty four here did they rest the princely care of douglas why should i declare or say they met reception fair or why the tidings say which varying to tantallon came by hurrying posts or fleet of fame with every varying day and first they heard king james had won etal and wark and ford and then that norham castle strong was ta'en at that sore marvelled marmion and douglas hoped his monarch's hand would soon subdue northumberland but whispered news there came that while his host inactive lay and melted by degrees away king james was dallying off the day with heron's wily dame such acts to chronicles i yield go seek them there and see mine is a tale of flod and field and not a history at length they heard the scottish host on that high ridge had made their post which frowns o'er millfield plain and that brave surrey many a band had gathered in the southern land and marched into northumberland and camp at woolatane marmion like charger in the stall that hears without the trumpet call began to chafe and swear a sorry thing to hide my head in castle like a fearful maid when such a field is near needs must i see this battle day death to my fame if such a fray were fought and marmion away 
the douglas too i wot not why hath baited of his courtesy no longer in his halls i'll stay then bade his band they should array for march against the dawning day end of section ten Section eleven of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field, by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction to Canto Sixth, to Richard Heber, Esquire, Merton House, Christmas. Heap on more wood, the wind is chill, but let it whistle as it will, we'll keep our Christmas merry still. Each age has deemed the newborn year the fittest time for festal cheer even heathen yet the savage dane at Iole more deep the mead did drain high on the beach his galleys drew and feasted all his pirate crew then in his low and pine-built hall where shields and axes decked the wall they gorged upon the half-dressed steer caroused in seas of sable beer while round in brutal jest were thrown the half-gnawed rib and marrow-bone all listened all in grim delight while scalds yelled out the joys of fight then forth in frenzy would they hie while wildly loose their red locks fly and dancing round the blazing pile they make such barbarous mirth the while as best might to the mind recall the boisterous joys of odin's hall and well our christian sires of old loved when the year its course had rolled and brought blithe christmas back again with all his hospitable train domestic and religious rite gave honour to the holy night on christmas eve the bells were rung on christmas eve the mass was sung that only night in all the year saw the stoled priest the chalice rear the damsel donned her kirtle sheen the hall was dressed with holly green forth to the wood did merry men go to gather in the mistletoe then opened wide the baron's hall to vassal tenant serf and all power laid his rod of rule aside and ceremony doffed his pride the heir with roses in his shoes that night might village partner choose the lord underogating share the vulgar game of post and pair all hailed with uncontrolled delight and general voice the happy night that to the cottage as the crown brought tidings of salvation down the fire with well-dried logs supplied went roaring up the chimney wide the huge hall table's oaken face scrubbed till it shone the day to grace bore then upon its massive board no mark to part the squire and lord then was brought in the lusty brawn by old blue-coated serving-man then the grim boar's head frowned on high crested with bays and rosemary well can the green-garbed ranger tell how when and where the monster fell what dogs before his death he tore and all the baiting of the boar the wassail round in good brown bowls garnished with ribbons blithely trolls there the huge sirloin reeked hard by plum porridge stood and christmas pie nor failed old scotland to produce at such high tide her savoury goose then came the merry maskers in and carols roared with blithesome din if unmelodious was the song it was a hearty note and strong who lists may in their mumming see traces of ancient mystery white shirts supplied the masquerade and smutted cheeks the visors made but oh what maskers richly dight can boast of bosoms half so light england was merry england when old christmas brought his sports again twas christmas broached the mightiest ale twas christmas told the merriest tale a christmas gambol oft could cheer the poor man's heart through half the year still linger in our northern clime some remnants of the good old time and still within our valleys here we hold the kindred title dear even when perchance its far-fetched claim to southron ear sounds empty name for course of blood our proverbs deem is warmer than the mountain stream and thus my christmas still i hold where my great-grandsire came of old with amber beard and flaxen hair and reverend apostolic air the feast and holy tide to share and mix sobriety with wine and honest mirth with thoughts divine small thought was his in after time ere to be hitched into a rhyme the simple sire could only boast that he was loyal to his cost the banished race of kings revered and lost his land but kept his beard in these dear halls where welcome kind is with fair liberty combined 
where cordial friendship gives the hand and flies constraint the magic wand of the fair dame that rules the land little we heed the tempest drear while music mirth and social cheer speed on their wings the passing year and merton's halls are fair in now when not a leaf is on the bough tweed loves them well and turns again as loath to leave the sweet domain and holds his mirror to her face and clips her with a close embrace gladly as he we seek the dome and as reluctant turn us home how just that at this time of glee my thoughts should heber turn to thee for many a merry hour we've known and heard the chimes of midnight's tone cease then my friend a moment cease and leave these classic tomes in peace of roman and of grecian lore sure mortal brain can hold no more these ancients as noll bluff might say were pretty fellows in their day but time and tide o'er all prevail on christmas eve a christmas tale of wonder and of war profane what leave the lofty latian strain her stately prose her verses charms to hear the clash of rusty arms in fairyland or limbo lost to jostle conjurer and ghost goblin and witch nay heber dear before you touch my charter here though leyden aids alas no more my cause with many languaged lore this may i say in realms of death ulysses meets alcides wraith aeneas upon thracia's shore the ghost of murdered polydore for omens we in livy cross at every turn locutus boss as grave and duly speaks that ox as if he told the price of stocks or held in rome republican the place of common councilman all nations have their omens drear their legends wild of woe and fear to cambria look the peasant see bethink him of glendowardy and shun the spirit's blasted tree a highlander whose red claymore the battle turned on maida's shore will on a friday morn look pale if asked to tell a fairy tale he fears the vengeful elfin king who leaves that day his grassy ring invisible to human ken he walks among the sons of men didst e'er dear heber pass along beneath the towers of franchemont which like an eagle's nest in air hang o'er the stream and hamlet fair deep in their vaults the peasants say a mighty treasure buried lay amassed through rapine and through wrong by the last lord of franchemont the iron chest is bolted hard a huntsman sits its constant guard around his neck his horn is hung his hanger in his belt is slung before his feet his bloodhounds lie and twere not for his gloomy eye whose withering glance no heart can brook as true a huntsman doth he look as bugle e'er in brake did sound or ever hollowed to a hound to chase the fiend and win the prize in that same dungeon ever tries an aged necromantic priest it is an hundred years at least since twixt them first the strife begun and neither yet has lost nor won and oft the conjurer's words will make the stubborn demon groan and quake and oft the bands of iron break or bursts one lock that still amain fast as tis opened shuts again that magic strife within the tomb may last until the day of doom unless the adept shall learn to tell the very word that clenched the spell when franchement locked the treasure cell an hundred years are passed and gone and scarce three letters has he won such general superstition may excuse for old pitt scotty say whose gossip history has given my song the messenger from heaven that warned in lithgow scotland's king nor less the infernal summoning may pass the monk of durham's tale whose demon fought in gothic mail may pardon plead for forden grave who told of gifford's goblin cave but why such instances to you who in an instant can renew your treasured hordes of various lore and furnish twenty thousand more hordes not like theirs whose volumes rest like treasures in the franchement chest while gripple owners still refuse to others what they cannot use give them the priest's whole century they shall not spell you letters three their pleasure in the books the same the magpie takes in pilfered gem thy volumes open as thy heart delight amusement science art to every ear and eye impart yet who of all who thus employ them can like the owner's self enjoy them but hark i hear the distant drum the day of flodden field is come adieu dear heber life and health and store of literary wealth end of section eleven
Section 12 of Marmion, A Tale of Flodden Field, by Walter Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto Sixth The Battle While great events were on the gale, and each hour brought a varying tale, and the demeanour changed and cold of Douglas fretted Marmion bold, and like the impatient steed of war he snuffed the battle from afar and hopes were none that back again herald should come from teruen where england's king in leaguer lay before decisive battle day whilst these things were the mournful clare did in the dame's devotions share for the good countess ceaseless prayed to heaven and saints her sons to aid and with short interval did pass from prayer to book from book to mass and all in high baronial pride a life both dull and dignified yet as lord marmion nothing pressed upon her intervals of rest dejected clara well could bear the formal state the lengthened prayer though dearest to her wounded heart the hours that she might spend apart two i said tantalon's dizzy steep hung o'er the margin of the deep many a rude tower and rampart there repelled the insult of the air which when the tempest vexed the sky half breeze half spray came whistling by above the rest a turret square did o'er its gothic entrance bear of sculpture rude a stony shield the bloody heart was in the field and in the chief three mullets stood the cognizance of douglas blood the turret held a narrow stair which mounted gave you access where a parapet's embattled row did seaward round the castle go sometimes in dizzy steps descending sometimes in narrow circuit bending sometimes in platform broad extending its varying circle did combine bulwark and bartison and line and bastion tower and vantage coin above the booming ocean lent the far projecting battlement the billows burst in ceaseless flow upon the precipice below where'er tantalon faced the land gateworks and walls were strongly manned no need upon the seagirt side the steepy rock and frantic tide approach of human step denied and thus these lines and ramparts rude were left in deepest solitude three and for they were so lonely clare would to these battlements repair and muse upon her sorrows there and list the sea-birds cry or slow like noontide ghost would glide along the dark grey bulwark's side and ever on the heaving tide look down with weary eye oft did the cliff and swelling main recall the thoughts of whitby's fane a home she ne'er might see again for she had laid adown so douglas bad the hood and veil and frontlet of the cloister pale and benedictine gown it were unseemly sight he said a novice out of convent shade now her bright locks with sunny glow again adorned her brow of snow her mantle rich whose borders round a deep and fretted broidery bound in golden foldings sought the ground of holy ornament alone remained a cross with ruby stone and often did she look on that which in her hand she bore with velvet bound and broidered o'er her breviary in book in such a place so lone so grim at dawning pale or twilight dim it fearful would have been to meet a form so richly dressed with book in hand and cross on breast and such a woeful mien fitz eustace loitering with his bow to practise on the gull and crow saw her at distance gliding slow and did by mary swear some lovelorn fay she might have been or in romance some spellbound queen for ne'er in workday world was seen a form so witching fair four once walking thus at evening tide it chanced a gliding sail she spied and sighing thought the abbess there perchance does to her home repair her peaceful rule where duty free walks hand in hand with charity where oft devotion's tranced glow can such a glimpse of heaven bestow that the enraptured sisters see high vision and deep mystery the very form of hilda fair hovering upon the sunny air and smiling on her votary's prayer oh wherefore to my duller eye did still the saint her form deny was it that seared by sinful scorn my heart could neither melt nor burn or lie my warm affections low with him that taught them first to glow yet gentle abbess well i knew to pay thy kindness grateful due 
and well could brook the mild command that ruled thy simple maiden band how different now condemned to bide my doom from this dark tyrant's pride but marmion has to learn ere long that constant mind and hate of wrong descended to a feeble girl from red declare stout gloucester's earl of such a stem a sapling weak he ne'er shall bend although he break five but see what makes this armour here for in her path there lay targe corslet helm she viewed them near the breastplate pierced ay much i fear weak fence wert thou gainst foeman's spear that hath made fatal entrance here as these dark blood gouts say thus wilton oh not corslet's ward not truth as diamond pure and hard could be thy manly bosom's guard on yon disastrous day she raised her eyes in mournful mood wilton himself before her stood it might have seemed his passing ghost for every youthful grace was lost and joy unwonted and surprise gave their strange wildness to his eyes expect not noble dames and lords that i can tell such scene in words what skilful limner e'er would choose to paint the rainbow's varying hues unless to mortal it were given to dip his brush in dyes of heaven far less can my weak line declare each changing passion's shade brightening to rapture from despair sorrow surprise and pity there and joy with her angelic air and hope that paints the future fair their varying hues displayed each o'er its rival's ground extending alternate conquering shifting blending till all fatigued the conflict yield and mighty love retains the field shortly i tell what then he said by many a tender word delayed and modest blush and bursting sigh and question kind and fond reply six de wilton's history forget we that disastrous day when senseless in the lists i lay thence dragged but how i cannot know for sense and recollection fled i found me on a pallet low within my ancient beadsman's shed austin rememberest thou my clare how thou didst blush when the old man when first our infant love began said we would make a matchless pair menials and friends and kinsmen fled from the degraded traitor's bed he only held my burning head and tended me for many a day while wounds and fever held their sway but far more needful was his care when sense returned to wake despair for i did tear the closing wound and dash me frantic on the ground if e'er i heard the name of clare at length to calm a reason brought much by his kind attendance wrought with him i left my native strand and in a palmer's weeds arrayed my hated name and form to shade i journeyed many a land no more a lord of rank and birth but mingled with the dregs of earth oft austin for my reason feared when i would sit and deeply brood on dark revenge and deeds of blood or wild mad schemes upreared my friend at length fell sick and said god would remove him soon and while upon his dying bed he begged of me a boon if e'er my deadliest enemy beneath my brand should conquered lie even then my mercy should awake and spare his life for austin's sake seven still restless as a second cane to scotland next my route was ta'en full well the paths i knew fame of my fate made various sound that death in pilgrimage i found that i had perished of my wound none cared which tale was true and living eye could never guess de wilton in his palmer's dress for now that sable slough is shed and trimmed my shaggy beard and head i scarcely know me in the glass a chance most wondrous did provide that i should be that baron's guide i will not name his name vengeance to god alone belongs but when i think on all my wrongs my blood is liquid flame and ne'er the time shall i forget when in a scottish hostel set dark looks we did exchange what were his thoughts i cannot tell but in my bosom mustered hell its plans of dark revenge eight a word of vulgar augury that broke from me i scarce knew why brought on a village tale which wrought upon his moody sprite and sent him armoured forth by night i borrowed steed and mail and weapons from his sleeping band and passing from a postern door we met and countered hand to hand he fell on gifford moor for the death-stroke my brand i drew 
oh then my helmet head he knew the palmer's cowl was gone then had three inches of my blade the heavy debt of vengeance paid my hand the thought of austin stayed i left him there alone o oh, good old man even from the grave thy spirit could thy master save if i had slain my foeman ne'er had whitby's abbess in her fear given to my hand this packet dear of power to clear my injured fame and vindicate de wilton's name perchance you heard the abbess tell of the strange pageantry of hell that broke our secret speech it rose from the infernal shade or featly was some juggle played a tale of peace to teach appeal to heaven i judged was best when my name came among the rest nine now here within tantallon hold to douglas late my tale i told to whom my house was known of old won by my proofs his falchion bright this even you shall dub me knight these were the arms that once did turn the tide of fight on otterburn and harry hotspur forced to yield when the dead douglas won the field these angus gave his armourer's care ere morn shall every breach repair for naught he said was in his halls but ancient armour on the walls and aged chargers in the stalls and women priests and grey-haired men the rest were all in tweezel glen and now i watch my armour here by law of arms till midnight's near then once again a belted knight seek surrey's camp with dawn of light Ten there soon again we meet my clare this baron means to guide thee there douglas reveres his king's command else would he take thee from his band and there thy kinsman surrey too will give de wilton justice due now meet afar for martial broil firmer my limbs and strung by toil once more o oh, wilton must we then risk new-found happiness again trust fate of arms once more and is there not an humble glen where we content and poor might build a cottage in the shade a shepherd thou and i to aid thy task on dale and moor that reddening brow too well i know not even thy clare can peace bestow while falsehood stains thy name go then to fight clare bids thee go clare can a warrior's feelings know and weep a warrior's shame can red earl gilbert's spirit feel buckle the spurs upon thy heel and belt thee with thy brand of steel and send thee forth to fame eleven that night upon the rocks and bay the midnight moonbeam slumbering lay and poured its silver light and pure through loophole and through embrasure upon tantallon tower and hall but chief where archered windows wide illuminate the chapel's pride the sober glances fall much was their need though seemed with scars two veterans of the douglas's wars though two grey priests were there and each a blazing torch held high you could not by their blaze descry the chapel's carving fair amid that dim and smoky light chequering the silvery moonshine bright a bishop by the altar stood a noble lord of douglas blood with mitre sheen and roque white yet showed his meek and thoughtful eye but little pride of prelacy more pleased that in a barbarous age he gave rude scotland virgil's page than that beneath his rule he held the bishopric of fair dunkeld beside him ancient angus stood doffed his furred gown and sable hood o'er his huge form and visage pale he wore a cap and shirt of mail and leaned his large and wrinkled hand upon the huge and sweeping brand which wont of yore in battle fray his foeman's limbs to shred away as wood knife lops the sapling spray he seemed as from the tombs around rising at judgment day some giant douglas may be found in all his old array so pale his face so huge his limb so old his arms his look so grim twelve then at the altar wilton kneels and clear the spurs bound on his heels and think what next he must have felt at buckling of the falchion belt and judge how clara changed her hue while fastening to her lover's side a friend which though in danger tried he once had found untrue then douglas struck him with his blade st michael and st andrew aid i dub thee knight arise sir ralph de wilton's heir for king for church for lady fair see that thou fight and bishop gawain as he rose said wilton grieve not for thy woes disgrace and trouble 
for he who honour best bestows may give thee double de wilton sobbed for sob he must where'er i meet a douglas trust that douglas is my brother nay nay old angus said not so to surrey's camp thou now must go thy wrongs no longer smother i have two sons in yonder field and if thou meet'st them under shield upon them bravely do thy worst and foul fall him that blenches first thirteen not far advanced was morning day when marmion did his troop array to surrey's camp to ride he had safe conduct for his band beneath the royal seal and hand and douglas gave a guide the ancient earl with stately grace would clara on her palfrey place and whispered in an undertone let the hawk stoop his prey is flown the train from out the castle drew but marmion stopped to bid adieu though something i might plain he said of cold respect to stranger guest sent hither by your king's behest while in tantalon's towers i stayed part we in friendship from your land and noble earl receive my hand but douglas round him drew his cloak folded his arms and thus he spoke my manors halls and bowers shall still be open at my sovereign's will to each one whom he lists howe'er unmeet to be the owner's peer my castles are my kings alone from turret to foundation stone the hand of douglas is his own and never shall in friendly grasp the hand of such as marmion clasp fourteen burned marmion's swarthy cheek like fire and shook his very frame for ire and this to me he said and twere not for thy hoary beard such hand as marmion's had not spared to cleave the douglas's head and first i tell thee haughty peer he who does england's message here although the meanest in her state may well proud angus be thy mate and douglas more i tell thee here even in thy pitch of pride here in thy hold thy vassals near nay never look upon your lord and lay your hands upon your sword i tell thee thou art defied and if thou saidst i am not peer to any lord in scotland here lowland or highland far or near lord angus thou hast lied on the earl's cheek the flush of rage o'ercame the ashen hue of age fierce he broke forth and darest thou then to beard the lion in his den the douglas in his hall and hopest thou hence unscathed to go no by saint bride of bothwell no up drawbridge grooms what warder ho let the portcullis fall lord marmion turned well was his need and dashed the rolls in his steed like arrow through the archway sprung the ponderous grate behind him rung to pass there was such scanty room the bars descending raised his plume fifteen the steed along the drawbridge flies just as it trembled on the rise nor lighter does the swallow skim along the smooth lake's level brim and when lord marmion reached his band he halts and turns with clenched hand and shout of loud defiance pours and shook his gauntlet at the towers horse horse the douglas cried and chase but soon he reined his fury's pace a royal messenger he came though most unworthy of the name a letter forged sent jude to speed did ever knight so foul a deed at first in heart it liked me ill when the king praised his clerkly skill thanks to saint bothan son of mine save gawain ne'er could pen a line so swore i and i swear it still let my boy bishop fret his fill saint mary mend my fiery mood old age ne'er cools the douglas blood i thought to slay him where he stood tis pity of him too he cried bold can he speak and fairly ride i warrant him a warrior tried with this his mandate he recalls and slowly seeks his castle halls sixteen the day in marmion's journey wore yet ere his passion's gust was o'er they crossed the heights of stanrig moor his troop more closely there he scanned and missed the palmer from the band palmer or not young blount did say he parted at the peep of day good sooth it was in strange array in what array said marmion quick my lord i ill can spell the trick but all night long with clink and bang close to my couch did hammers clang at dawn the falling drawbridge rang and from a loophole while i peep old bell the cat came from the keep 
wrapped in a gown of sables fair as fearful of the morning air beneath when that was blown aside a rusty shirt of mail i spied by archibald one in bloody work against the saracen and turk last night it hung not in the hall i thought some marvel would befall and next i saw them saddled lead old cheviot forth the earl's best steed a matchless horse though something old prompt to his paces cool and bold i heard the sheriff sholto say the earl did much the master pray to use him on the battle day but he preferred nay henry cease thou sworn horse courser hold thy peace eustace thou bearst a brain i pray what did blount see at break of day seventeen in brief my lord we both descried for then i stood by henry's side the palmer mount and outwards ride upon the earl's own favourite steed all sheathed he was in armour bright and much resembled that same knight subdued by you in cotswold fight lord angus wished him speed the instant that fitz eustace spoke a sudden light on marmion broke ah dastard fool to reason lost he muttered twas nor fay nor ghost i met upon the moonlight wald but living man of earthly mould o oh, dotage blind and gross had i but fought as wont one thrust had laid de wilton in the dust my path no more to cross how stand we now he told his tale to douglas and with some avail twas therefore gloomed his rugged brow will surrey dare to entertain gainst marmion charge disproved and vain small risk of that i trow yet clare's sharp questions must i shun must separate constance from the nun oh what a tangled web we weave when first we practise to deceive a palmer too no wonder why i felt rebuked beneath his eye i might have known there was but one whose look could quell lord marmion eighteen stung with these thoughts he urged to speed his troop and reached at eve the tweed where lenel's convent closed their march there now is left but one frail arch yet mourn thou not its cells our time a fair exchange has made hard by in hospitable shade a reverend pilgrim dwells well worth the whole bernardine brood that e'er wore sandal frock or hood yet did st bernard's abbot there give marmy an entertainment fair and lodging for his train and clare next morn the baron climbed the tower to view afar the scottish power encamped on flodden edge the white pavilions made a show like remnants of the winter snow along the dusky ridge long marmion looked at length his eye unusual movement might descry amid the shifting lines the scottish host drawn out appears for flashing on the hedge of spears the eastern sunbeam shines their front now deepening now extending their flank inclining wheeling bending now drawing back and now descending the skilful marmion well could know they watched the motions of some foe who traversed on the plain below nineteen even so it was from flodden ridge the scots beheld the english host leave balm or wood their evening post and heedful watched them as they crossed the till by twizzle bridge high sight it is and haughty while they dive into the deep defile beneath the caverned cliff they fall beneath the castle's airy wall by rock by oak by hawthorn tree troop after troop are disappearing troop after troop their banners rearing upon the eastern bank you see still pouring down the rocky den where flows the sullen till and rising from the dimwood glen standards on standards men on men in slow succession still and sweeping o'er the gothic arch and pressing on in ceaseless march to gain the opposing hill that morn to many a trumpet clang twizzle thy rock's deep echo rang and many a chief of birth and rank saint helen at thy fountain drank thy hawthorn glade which now we see in springtide bloom so lavishly had then from many an axe its doom to give the marching columns room twenty and why stands scotland idly now dark flodden on thy airy brow since england gains the pass the while and struggles through the deep defile what checks the fiery soul of james why sits that champion of the dames inactive on his steed and sees between him and his land between him and tweed's southern strand his host lord surrey lead what veils the vain knight-errant's brand o douglas for thy leading wand fierce randolph for thy speed 
oh for one hour of wallace white or well-skilled bruce to rule the fight and cry st andrew and our right another sight had seen that morn from fate's dark book a leaf been torn and flodden had been bannockborn the precious hour has passed in vain and england's host has gained the plain wheeling their march and circling still around the base of flodden hill twenty one ere yet the bands met marmion's eye fitz eustace shouted loud and high hark hark my lord an english drum and see ascending squadrons come between tweed's river and the hill foot horse and cannon hap what hap my basnet to apprentice cap lord surrey's o'er the till yet more yet more how far arrayed they file from out the hawthorn shade and sweep so gallant by with all their banners bravely spread and all their armour flashing high st george might waken from the dead to see fair england's standards fly stint in thy prate quoth blount thou'd best and listen to our lord's behest with kindling brow lord marmion said this instant be our band arrayed the river must be quickly crossed that we may join lord surrey's host if fight king james as well i trust that fight he will and fight he must the lady clare behind our lines shall tarry while the battle joins twenty two himself he swift on horseback through scarce to the abbot bade adieu far less would listen to his prayer to leave behind the helpless clare down to the tweed his band he drew and muttered as the flood they view the pheasant in the falcon's claw he scarce will yield to please adore lord angus may the abbot awe so clare shall bide with me then on that dangerous ford and deep where to the tweed leets eddies creep he ventured desperately and not a moment will he bide till squire or groom before him ride headmost of all he stems the tide and stems it gallantly eustace held clare upon her horse old hubert led her rein stoutly they braved the current's course and though far downward driven per force the southern bank they gain behind them straggling came to shore as best they might the train each o'er his head his u-bow bore a caution not in vain deep need that day that every string by wet unharmed should sharply ring a moment then lord marmion stayed and breathed his steed his men arrayed then forward moved his band until lord surrey's rearguard won he halted by a cross of stone that on a hillock standing lone did all the field command twenty three hence might they see the full array of either host for deadly fray their marshalled lines stretched east and west and fronted north and south and distant salutation passed from the loud cannon mouth not in the close successive rattle that breathes the voice of modern battle but slow and far between the hillock gained lord marmion stayed here by this cross he gently said you well may view the scene here shalt thou tarry lovely clare oh think of marmion in thy prayer thou wilt not well no less my care shall watchful for thy wheel prepare you blount and eustace are her guard with ten picked archers of my train with england if the day go hard to berwick speed amain but if we conquer cruel maid my spoils shall at your feet be laid when here we meet again he waited not for answer there and would not mark the maid's despair nor heed the discontented look from either squire but spurred amain and dashing through the battle plain his way to surrey took twenty four the good lord marmion by my life welcome to danger's hour short greeting serves in time of strife thus have i ranged my power myself will rule this central host stout stanley fronts their right my sons command the vaward post with brian tunstall stainless knight lord dacry with his horsemen light shall be in rearward of the fight and succour those that need it most now gallant marmion well i know would gladly to the vanguard go edmund the admiral tunstall there with thee their charge will blithely share there fight thine own retainers too beneath de burg thy steward true thanks noble surrey marmion said nor farther greeting there he paid but parting like a thunderbolt first in the vanguard made a halt where such a shout there rose of marmion marmion that the cry up flodden mountain shrilling high startled the scottish foes Twenty five blount and fitz eustace rested still with lady clare upon the hill on which for far the day was spent the western sunbeams now were bent the cry they heard its meaning knew could plain their distant comrades view 
sadly to blount did eustace say unworthy office here to stay no hope of gilded spurs to-day but see look up on flodden bent the scottish foe has fired his tent and sudden as he spoke from the sharp ridges of the hill all downward to the banks of till was wreathed in sable smoke volumed and fast and rolling far the cloud enveloped scotland's war as down the hill they broke nor martial shout nor minstrel tone announced their march their tread alone at times one warning trumpet blown at times a stifled hum told england from his mountain throne king james did rushing come scarce could they hear or see their foes until at weapon point they close they close in clouds of smoke and dust with sword sway and with lances thrust and such a yell was there of sudden and portentous birth as if men fought upon the earth and fiends in upper air oh life and death were in the shout recoil and rally charge and rout and triumph and despair long looked the anxious squires their eye could in the darkness naught descry twenty six at length the freshening western blast aside the shroud of battle cast and first the ridge of mingled spears above the brightening cloud appears and in the smoke the pennons flew as in the storm the white sea mew then marked they dashing broad and far the broken billows of the war and plumed crests of chieftains brave floating like foam upon the wave but naught distinct they see wide raged the battle on the plain spears shook and falchions flashed amain fell england's arrow flight like rain crests rose and stooped and rose again wild and disorderly amid the scene of tumult high they saw lord marmion's falcon fly and stainless tunstall's banner white and edmund howard's lion bright still bear them bravely in the fight although against them come of gallant gordon's many a one and many a stubborn badenoch man and many a rugged border clan with huntley and with home twenty seven far on the left unseen the while stanley broke lennox and argyle though there the western mountaineer rushed with bare bosom on the spear and flung the feeble targe aside and with both hands the broadsword plied twas vain but fortune on the right with fickle smile cheered scotland's fight then fell that spotless banner white the howard's lion fell yet still lord marmion's falcon flew with wavering flight while fiercer grew around the battle yell the border slogan rent the sky a home a gordon was the cry loud were the clanging blows advanced forced back now low now high the pennon sunk and rose as bends the bark's mast in the gale when rent a rigging shrouds and sail it wavered mid the foes no longer blount the view could bear by heaven and all its saints i swear i will not see it lost fitz eustace you with lady clare may bid your beads and pat a prayer i gallop to the host and to the fray he rode amain followed by all the archer train the fiery youth with desperate charge made for a space an opening large the rescued banner rose but darkly closed the war around like pine tree rooted from the ground it sank among the foes then eustace mounted too yet stayed as loath to leave the helpless maid when fast as shaft can fly blood shot his eyes his nostrils spread the loose rein dangling from his head housing and saddle bloody red lord marmion's steed rushed by and eustace maddening at the sight a look and sign to clara cast to mark he would return in haste then plunged into the fight twenty eight ask me not what the maiden feels left in that dreadful hour alone perchance her reason stoops or reels perchance a courage not her own braces her mind to desperate tone the scattered van of england wheels she only said as loud in air the tumult roared is wilton there they fly or maddened by despair fight but to die is wilton there with that straight up the hill there rode two horsemen drenched with gore and in their arms a helpless load a wounded knight they bore his hand still strained the broken brand his arms were smeared with blood and sand dragged from among the horse's feet with dinted shield and helmet beat the falcon crest and plumage gone can that be haughty marmion young blount his armour did unlace and gazing on his ghastly face said by saint george he's gone that spear wound has our master sped and see the deep cut on his head good night to marmion unnurtured blount thy brawling cease he opes his eyes said eustace peace 
twenty nine when doffed his cask he felt free air around gan marmion wildly stare where's harry blount fitz eustace where linger ye here ye hearts of hair redeem my pennon charge again cry marmion to the rescue vain last of my race on battle plain that shout shall ne'er be heard again yet my last thought is england's fly to dacre bear my signet ring tell him his squadrons up to bring fitz eustace to lord surrey high tunstall lies dead upon the field his life-blood stains the spotless shield edmund is down my life is reft the admiral alone is left let stanley charge with spur of fire with chester charge and lancashire full upon scotland's central host or victory and england's lost must i bid twice hence varlets fly leave marmion here alone to die they parted and alone he lay Clare drew her from the sight away, till pain rung forth a lowly moan, and half he murmured, Is there none of all my halls have nursed, page, squire, or groom, one cup to bring of blessed water from the spring to slake my dying thirst? 30. O woman, in our hours of ease, uncertain, coy, and hard to please, and variable as the shade by the light quivering aspen made, when pain and anguish wring the brow, a ministering angel thou scarce were the piteous accents said when with the baron's cask the maid to the nice streamlet ran forgot were hatred wrongs and fears the plaintive voice alone she hears sees but the dying man she stooped her by the runnel's side but in abhorrence backward drew for oozing from the mountain's side where raged the war a dark red tide was curdling in the streamlet blue where shall she turn behold her mark a little fountain's cell where water clear as diamond spark in a stone basin fell above some half-worn letters say drink weary pilgrim drink and pray for the kind soul of sibyl gray who built this cross and well she filled the helm and back she hied and with surprise and joy espied a monk supporting marmion's head a pious man whom duty brought to dubious verge of battle fought to shrieve the dying bless the dead thirty one deep drank lord marmion of the wave and as she stooped his brow to lave is it the hand of clare he said or injured constance bathes my head then as remembrance rose speak not to me of shrift or prayer i must redress her woes short space few words are mine to spare forgive and listen gentle clare alas she said the while oh think of your immortal weal in vain for constance is your zeal she died at holy isle lord marmion started from the ground as light as if he felt no wound though in the action burst the tide in torrents from his wounded side then it was truth he said i knew that the dark presage must be true I would the fiend to whom belongs the vengeance due to all her wrongs would spare me but a day for wasting fire and dying groan and priests slain on the altar stone might bribe him for delay it may not be this dizzy trance curse on yon base marauder's lance and doubly cursed my failing brand a sinful heart makes feeble hand then fainting down on earth he sunk supported by the trembling monk thirty two with fruitless labour clara bound and strove to stanch the gushing wound the monk with unavailing cares exhausted all the church's prayers ever he said that close and near a lady's voice was in his ear and that the priest he could not hear for that she ever sung in the lost battle borne down by the flying where mingles wars rattle with groans of the dying so the notes rung avoid thee fiend with cruel hand shake not the dying sinner's sand o oh, look my son upon yon sign of the redeemer's grace divine o oh, think on faith and bliss by many a deathbed i have been and many a sinner's parting scene but never aught like this the war that for a space did fail now trebly thundering swelled the gale and stanley was the cry a light on marmion's visage spread and fired his glazing eye with dying hand above his head he shook the fragment of his blade and shouted victory charge chester charge on stanley on were the last words of marmion thirty three 
by this though deep the evening fell still rose the battle's deadly swell for still the scots around their king unbroken fought in desperate ring where's now their victor wayward wing where huntley and where home oh for a blast of that dread horn on font arabian echoes borne that to king charles did come when roland brave and olivier and every paladin and peer on Roncesvalles died such blasts might warn them not in vain to quit the plunder of the slain and turn the doubtful day again while yet on flodden's side afar the royal standard flies and round it toils and bleeds and dies our caledonian pride in vain the wish for far away while spoil and havoc mark their way near sibyl's cross the plunderers stray o oh, lady cried the monk away and placed her on her steed and led her to the chapel fair of tilmouth upon tweed there all the night they spent in prayer and at the dawn of morning there she met her kinsman lord fitzclair thirty four but as they left the darkening heath more desperate grew the strife of death the english shafts in volleys hailed in headlong charge their horse assailed front flank and rear the squadrons sweep to break the scottish circle deep that fought around their king but yet though thick the shafts are snow though charging knights like whirlwinds go though billmen ply the ghastly blow unbroken was the ring the stubborn spearmen still made good their dark impenetrable wood each stepping where his comrade stood the instant that he fell no thought was there of dastard flight linked in the serried phalanx tight groom fought like noble squire like knight as fearlessly and well till utter darkness closed her wing o'er their thin host and wounded king then skilful surrey's sage commands led back from strife his shattered bands and from the charge they drew as mountain waves from wasted lands sweep back to ocean blue then did their loss his foemen know their king their lords their mightiest low they melted from the field as snow when streams are swollen and south winds blow dissolves in silent dew tweed's echoes heard the ceaseless plash while many a broken band disordered through her currents dash to gain the scottish land to town and tower to down and dale to tell red flodden's dismal tale and raise the universal wail tradition legend tune and song shall many an age that wail prolong still from the sire the son shall hear of the stern strife and carnage drear of flodden's fatal field where shivered was fair scotland's spear and broken was her shield thirty five day dawns upon the mountain's side there scotland lay thy bravest pride chiefs knights and nobles many a one the sad survivors all are gone view not that corpse mistrustfully defaced and mangled though it be nor to yon border castle high look northward with upbraiding eye nor cherish hope in vain that journeying far on foreign strand the royal pilgrim to his land may yet return again he saw the wreck his rashness wrought reckless of life he desperate fought and fell on flodden plain and well in death his trusty brand firm clenched within his manly hand beseemed the monarch slain but oh how changed since yon blithe night gladly i turn me from the sight unto my tale again thirty six short is my tale fitz eustace care a pierced and mangled body bare to moated lichfield's lofty pile and there beneath the southern isle a tomb with gothic sculpture fair did long lord marmion's image bear now vainly for its sight you look twas levelled when fanatic brook the fair cathedral stormed and took but thanks to heaven and good saint chad a guerdon meet the spoiler had there erst was marshal marmion found his feet upon a couchant hound his hands to heaven upraised and all around on scutcheon rich and tablet carved and fretted niche his arms and feet were blazed and yet though all was carved so fair and priest for marmion breathed the prayer the last lord marmion lay not there from ettrick woods a peasant swain followed his lord to flodden plain one of those flowers whom plaintive lay in scotland mourns as weed away sore wounded sibyl's cross he spied and dragged him to its foot and died close by the noble marmion's side the spoilers stripped and gashed the slain and thus their corpses were mistain and thus in the proud baron's tomb the lowly woodsman took the room 
37. Less easy task it were to show Lord Marmion's nameless grave and lo. They dug his grave in where he lay, but every mark is gone. Time's wasting hand has done away the simple cross of Sybil Grey, and broke her font of stone. But yet from out the little hill oozes the slender springlet still, oft halts the stranger there. For thence may best his curious eye the memorable field descry, and shepherd boys repair to seek the water flag and rush and rest them by the hazel bush, and plait their garlands fair. Nor dream they sit upon the grave that holds the bones of Marmion brave. When thou shalt find the little hill, with thy heart commune and be still. If ever in temptation strong thou left'st the right path for the wrong, if every devious step thus trod still led thee farther from the road, dread thou to speak presumptuous doom on noble Marmion's lowly tomb, but say, he died a gallant knight with sword in hand for England's right. 38. I do not rhyme to that dull elf who cannot image to himself that all through Flodden's dismal night Wilton was foremost in the fight. That when brave Surrey's steed was slain, t'was Wilton mounted him again. T'was Wilton's brand that deepest hewed amid the spearman's stubborn wood. Unnamed by Hollinshead or Hall, he was the living soul of all. That after fight, his faith made plain, he won his rank and lands again, and charged his old paternal shield with bearings won on Flodden Field. Nor sing I to that simple maid to whom it must in terms be said that king and kinsman did agree to bless fair Clara's constancy, who cannot, unless I relate, paint to her mind the bridal's state, that Wolsey's voice the blessing spoke, Moore, Sands, and Denny passed the joke, that bluff King Hal the curtain drew, and Catherine's hand the stocking threw, and afterwards for many a day that it was held enough to say, in blessing to a wedded pair, Love they like Wilton and like Clare. End of Canto Sixth L'envoi To the reader Why then a final note prolong or lengthen out a closing song unless to bid the gentle speed who long have listed to my reed to statesmen grave if such may deign to read the minstrel's idle strain sound head, clean hand and piercing wit and patriotic heart as Pitt, a garland for the hero's crest, and twined by her he loves the best. To every lovely lady bright, what can I wish but faithful knight? To every faithful lover too, what can I wish but lady true? And knowledge to the studious sage, and pillow to the head of age. To thee, dear schoolboy, whom my lay has cheated of thy hour of play, light task and merry holiday. To all, to each, a fair good night, and pleasing dreams, and slumbers light. End of section twelve. End of Marmion, a tale of Flodden Field by Walter Scott.